Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to TerraSEM's 10th uh, annual workshop on geoethical nanotechnology. My name is Lori Rhodes. I'm the legal researcher for TerraSEM Movement, and I will be your conference convener and moderator today. Now, I, I'd like to begin each of these workshops with a list of tips and hints for attendees and speakers alike. So please allow me a few moments to go over these. They are on the screen behind me. Only the presenter will be advancing the slides on any presentation screen, so if you're an attendee, please resist playing with anything at the podium. Unless you are a presenter, please do not engage your speaker or voice chat during the workshop. A Q&A session will follow each presentation. Questions are limited to the text box found at the lower left toolbar marked chat. If you click it, it will remain up during the uh, workshop. The presenter will address only those questions appearing within the chat history box. I may offer some assistance to ensure, time permitting, that all questions are addressed by the presenters. If you are a presenter, make sure that your cell phones or other signal admitting devices are either turned off or sufficiently away from your computer during the time your microphone is engaged. Failing to do so may interfere with your audio. Please keep in mind that these proceedings are being recorded. Uh, people will be walking in and out uh, given the time availabilities that they have throughout the world. This event has been, um, has been advertised in the social networks and via press release. Well, thank you, and I hope everyone has a wonderful workshop experience. I will now take us into the convening presentation. Um, I will go through this convening presentation and then I will introduce our first speaker. Now some of you may be wondering, what is geoethical nanotechnology? Why is this workshop on the anniversary of the first lunar landing? And how does this tie in with the Jesuit priest Pierre Teilhard de Jardin? Well, geoethics, as defined by Terrorism's founder, Dr. Martin Rothblatt, is the study of technology risk benefit management across geographic spaces. The purpose of creating the workshop is to create a geoethical safe harbor, if you will, for nanotechnology, a safe harbor uniting science, technology, and religion. Terrorism hosts this workshop on the anniversary of the first lunar launch, which is also known as Space Day, because nothing within the last 100 years better exemplifies the ability of people to take something said to be impossible, like space flight, and make it possible, and do so so quickly, from goal to reality in less than 10 years. Tara Desjardins was a Jewish priest, paleontologist, and geologist, studying the science of evolution and human origin and the mysteries of the universe. In 1921, as a paleontologist, Tanner participated in the discovery of the Peking Man in China. This depicted the broad stages of human evolution, as the Peking Man dated back roughly 750,000 years. Due to his work in evolution, much of Taylor's writings were censored by the Catholic Church and not published until well after his death in 1955, considered a, to con contradict orthodoxy. Geoethics is an evolving concept that treats the planet or a planet as a patient. Heal the planet, but first do no harm. Per Eric Drexler's 1986 Engines of Creation, nanotechnology is the precision building of something, atom by atom, molecule by molecule. Terre Desjardins, in his studies of evolution and human origin, may have likened nanotechnology to what he called intentional holiness, as matter is holy and God is directional. The Terrorism Movement believes nanotechnology will be one of evolution's primary vectors for improving human lot and disseminating humanity universally. Terre Desjardins, within his activation of energy, is quoted, we might say at this moment, as in the time of Galileo, what we most urgently need in order to 
appreciate the convergence of the universe is much new is, is much less new facts than a new way of looking at the facts and accepting them a new way of seeing combined with a new way of action that is what we need Taryn is said to have predicted the global interconnectedness promoted by the internet did he predict nanotechnology as well what might Taryn say about nanotechnology Geoethics is a key mission of TerraSEM as diversity demands integration with nanotech. Unity requires an agreement amongst those who may be adversely affected by the risks. And joyful and continued existence requires that the ratio of benefit to adverse uses of technology be maximized. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker today a science and technology futurist and author of God and Science, Faith, Science, and the Future, Reverend Charles Henderson. Please come up to the podium. Shall we begin? Yes, you have the floor. Okay, great. Thank you, Lori. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. If, yes. Okay, if we were in real life, I would, uh, with this number of people, form a circle and we'd all sit around and we would d discuss uh, together in a group. But since it's going to be uh, documented for later uh, distribution on other formats, um, I'm going to stick to the lecture concept, leaving uh, time for questions, uh, perhaps pausing in the middle to get some, and also at the end. So I'm glad to be here and uh, look forward to chatting with you all uh, after I have given put out some ideas about Teilhard de Chardin. Now, before approaching the topic of how Teilhard de Chardin might have felt, and we can only speculate about that, might have felt about geo uh, geoethical nanotechnology. I think it might be helpful to give a brief overview of his place in the intellectual life of the 20th century, as well as his central contribution, namely his effort to show that science and religion are, were both indispensable to human thriving, and by extension that technology in service to both is critical. As a matter of fact, Teilhard stands tall among the very few leaders of thought in the 20th century to integrate scientific research with religious vocation. At an early point in his career, this paleontologist and Jesuit priest made it his personal mission to reconstruct the most basic Christian doctrines from the perspectives of science and at the same time to reconstruct science from the perspective of faith. He would do this by overthrowing all the barriers that had been erected between science and religion in the prior 100 years, and mainly in reaction to Charles Darwin. He would take the lessons learned from the study of nature as the foundation on which to reconstruct Christian theology. He would single handedly remake all the dogmas of his own Catholic Church, and he would, this, would at the same time remake the world of modern science on the model suggested by his personal experience of God. Now, this is a breathtaking project when you think about it. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the magnitude of what he was trying to accomplish, Teilhard was seen by the Vatican as a major threat. Rome insisted that his religious writings should not be published. He was forbidden to teach or even to speak publicly on religious topics. He was banished from his native country. Yet his ideas were disseminated informally and sometimes secretly by his friends and colleagues within the church. He became a hero and a role model for an entire generation of young priests and theologians. 
Arguably, he set the stage for the renewal movements which finally came to flower in Vatican II. Indeed, the shockwaves which he set in motion are still shaking our culture and influencing our thought six decades after his death in 1955. <coughs> Yet even as his thought and writing was shaking up the world of religion, it was also reverberating through the realm of science. In effect, Teilhard was suggesting nothing less than a program for the reconstruction of science itself. He put forward a systematic critique of traditional science which was just as radical and just as provocative as his criticism of traditional religion. He provoked equally extreme reactions in the scientific community. A small number of world-class scientists have taken his ideas seriously enough to construct their own work around Teilhard's model, but the majority have reacted as defensively uh, as the Vatican theologians. Case in point. If the very premise of Teilhard's work and thought is evolution, it is not surprising that the leading public advocate of Darwinism, Stephen Jay Gould, has gone to work trying to destroy Teilhard. Writing vehemently and dogmatically, like the guardian of established religion, Gould asserts that Teilhard's entire enterprise is illegitimate. Teilhard's essential insights are incompatible with science, Gould argues. In addition to that, Gould has made it his personal mission to expose Teilhard as being guilty of the most outrageous scientific fraud of modern times. Stepping back a pace, early in Teilhard's career as a student of theology, a chance meeting with the lawyer and amateur archaeologist Charles Darwin, Charles Dawson, led to an association which was later to prove both formative and fateful for Teilhard. At the time, though, Teilhard's association with Dawson contributed immensely to his progress as a scientist and within the scientific community. Dawson introduced him to the prominent author Smith Woodward, keeper of paleontology at the British Museum, Museum. Smith Woodward opened doors to the scientific establishment that would otherwise have been closed to a young Jesuit seminarian. In fact, Dawson and Smith Woodward were to become collaborators in one of the great events of paleontology, the quote-unquote discovery of the famous Piltdown Man, which, was, which they presented as an important missing link in the evolution of the human species. Teilhard participated with the two Englishmen in their excavations at Piltdown, and in the process, his own standing as a promising young paleontologist was established in scientific circles far beyond the precincts of his own Catholic Church. When Teilhard left England to begin his doctoral work, he was to become a student and eventually a colleague of Marcelin Bruhl, the greatest physical anthropologist in France at the time. Thus were the foundations laid for Teilhard's long and successful career as a paleontologist. However, in 1953, Piltdown Man was exposed as a deliberate hoax, perhaps the most astounding fraud in the history of modern science. Until recently, Dawson was believed to have acted alone in this. But in August of 1980, a quarter century after Teilhard's death, Stephen Jay Gould put forward his own view that Teilhard was a co-conspirator in the fraud. Gould first published his accusations in Natural History magazine and repeated his case with additional argument and discussion in his book, Hen's Teeth and Horse's Toes. Though his quote-unquote evidence is entirely circumstantial, Gould's accusations are tightly reasoned, as are the arguments of Teilhard's defenders, who have written and published their own views in reply. The briefs for and against Teilhard are way too complex to review here. Suffice it to say 
that the reconstruction of events that originally took place in the years between 1908 and 1914 is difficult in itself to draw firm conclusions based on circumstantial evidence in letters and remembrances written over a century ago is impossible. But partly as a result of these defensive and dogmatic reactions to Teilhard, his importance today is underestimated in both the religious and scientific establishments. While many of his ideas have worked their way anonymously into currency and have been widely accepted, Still, Teilhard's innovative thinking has been taken seriously only by a minority of thinkers who see science and religion entering into a new era of cross-fertilization and creativity, as I, for example, also believe. For the vast majority, however, Teilhard's thought seems marginal at best, and his insights are not studied in the depth they deserve. This is partially explained by the active suppression of his ideas within the church and the suspicion of his ideas within science. Teilhard's obscurity is also to be explained, however, by his own style of writing and his tendency to wander into the realm of speculation. His fertile imagination led him into a fantasy world foreign to science and theologians alike. When one cuts through his sometimes lurid prose, however, one encounters a series of highly imaginative proposals for the reunion of research and religion, and the questions raised by his works cannot be avoided. Anyone interested in extending the search for truth beyond the traditional boundaries between science and religion must wrestle with his basic insights. Step back in time just a few decades before this uh, denouement of his career. It was at the height of his career in paleontology, while he was studying bones and fossils in northern China way back in 1927, that Teilhard wrote what he called, quote, a little book of piety, designed to convey both the sincerity uh, of his work in science and the orthodoxy of his faith to his superiors in Rome, who were beginning to have their doubts. In this book, Teilhard speaks of, quote, the divine milieu, and by its very title suggests his theme, the whole material world as the setting for a profound mystical vision of God. It is the world itself as it is seen through the eyes of science that the workings of God are most obvious. Teilhard's writing is graphic and unrestrained. Quote, All around us, to right and left, in front and behind, above and below, we have only to go a little beyond the frontier of sensible appearance in order to see the divine welling up and showing through. But it is not only close to us, in front of us, that the divine presence has revealed itself. It has sprung up universally, and we find ourselves so surrounded and transfixed by it that there is no room left to fall down and adore it even within ourselves. By means of all created things, without exception, the divine assails us, penetrates us, and molds us. We imagined it as distant and inaccessible, whereas in fact we live steeped in its burning lairs. As Jacob said, awakening from his dream, the world, this palpable world, which we were wont to treat with boredom and disrespect, with which we habitually regard places of no sacred association for us, this world is truly a holy place and we did not know it." End of quote. Needless to say, writing like this did not reassure the religious authorities in Rome. For Teilhard affirmed the material world as a source of religious illumination. Though Teilhard did not directly criticize any specific doctrines of the church, in this little book of piety, 
this work constituted an assault upon the skeletal supports of traditional theology. Teilhard was just as provocative when he was trying to reassure as he was when he was trying to stir up debate. Early on, he describes his book in two sentences which were intended to convey the modesty of his position, but in reality contained a theological time bomb. Quote, this little book does no more than recapitulate the eternal lessons of the church in words of a man who, because he believes himself to feel deeply in tune with his own times, has sought to teach how to see God everywhere, to see God in all that is most hidden, most solid, and most ultimate in the world. These pages put forward no more than a practical attitude, or more exactly, perhaps, a way of teaching how to see. End of quote. Now, Teilhard says that he intends no more than to, quote, recapitulate the eternal lessons of the church, but he goes on to assert that he is actually teaching the church how to see, as if for the first time. As a scientist and an individual thinker, he is suggesting that the primary source of religious truth is to be found in the material world rather than the magisterium teaching authority of the church. In a real sense, it shall be science which shows theologians how to see. It shall be the personal experience of a single priest working on his own way off in distant China, which will indicate to the highest ecclesiastical authorities what is essential to Catholic teaching and, by implication, what is not essential. In a highly suggestive essay written in 1939, Teilhard traced the development of science the entire sweep and history of science from its earliest beginnings as a mere hobby to its present, quote, as he wrote, the solemn, prime, and vital occupation of man, end of quote. Teilhard follows science from its origins in the cultures of the ancient world through its period of expansiveness in the 19th century when it began to take on all the aspects of a substitute religion. Critical in this development of science, in Teilhard's view, was the theory of evolution and its notion of progress through time. With this sense of moving forward in time from the simplest life forms to the most complex, from the animal to the human species, from the most basic colonies of bacteria to the highest civilization, evolutionary science became much more than a method of collecting and classifying the facts of life. Increasing, increasingly, science was seen as a specific means by which humanity would move forward into the future. Teilhard wrote, Henceforth, science recognized itself as a means of extending and completing in man a world still incompletely formed. It assumed the shape of grandeur and a sacred duty. It became charged with futurity. In the great body already coming to birth of a humanity grouped by the act of discovery, a soul was at last released, a mysticism of discovery. Now, to be sure, in the 19th century, science enjoyed such success at explaining so many of the mysteries of life that it appeared to many that as, as if all the mysteries would one day be explained away. In physics, one could penetrate to the heart of matter and develop a clear understanding of that fundamental hum building block, the atom. In biology, the evolution of life forms could ultimately be explained through competition of the various species across the expanse of time. By the same token, intelligence could be understood as a function of the circuity of, in the brain, 
and the consciousness could be reduced to a complex series of chemical reactions, etc., etc. In other words, argues Teilhard, the mysticism of discovery was fast deteriorating into a mere worship of matter. The religious corollary of this trend was, of course, in the 1960s, the death of God theories. For if all the important processes of life could be understood through the tools of analysis just recently developed by science, what further need remained for faith in God or even mystery itself? In Teilhard's view, the situation changed dramatically, however, in the middle of the 20th century. In physics, atoms of cells were broken up and broken down into innumerable subparticles infinitely more mysterious than the alchemist ever imagined. Similarly, in biology, chemistry, and sociology, the important phenomena could not be reduced to the simple mechanisms that were once thought to lie at the heart of all things. Far from continuing to explain away the remaining mysteries, science had exposed still deeper mysteries at the very heart of matter itself. At a more mundane level, science did not prove to be the unmitigated blessing it was once believed to be. As we know, Teilhard lived long enough to witness the explosion of the world's first atomic weapons. And with these weapons, the fatal blow was delivered against the 19th century naive view of human progress. If the science of Darwin, Marx, and Freud seemed to make certain the death of God, the nuclear arms race secured the death of science as a substitute religion. In reaction against a naive anthropomorphic religion, science in its century of triumph had turned increasingly against any theory which cast nature into a human mold. Paradoxically, in the late 20th century, scientists recognized that there is no line of demarcation that can be drawn between the observer and the observed. The scientist, like the theologian, cannot take a completely, quote, objective position as if he were standing separate and apart from the phenomenon being studied one inevitably sees the world through human eyes and conceives of it in human images. Even when one makes every effort to avoid doing so, one still tends to make the world into a mirror. A majority of scientists have dealt with this situation, as does Stephen Jay Gould, for example, by opting for militant skepticism. Not only has God been shut out of science, but also any attempt to see in nature evidence of a final plan, purpose, or design is rejected out of hand. The very notion of progress itself has been subjected to withering criticism. Teilhard even dealt with this problem. As he put it, quote, asked whether life is, quote, going anywhere, Nine biologists out of ten will tell you, no, it is not. They will say so passionately. They will say it is abundantly clear to every eye that organic matter is in a state of continual metamorphosis, and even that this metamorphosis brings with time brings it with time toward more and more improbable forms. But what scale can we find to assess the absolute? or even the relative value of these fragile constructions. By what right, for instance, can we say that a mammal, even in the case of man, is more advanced, more perfect than a bee or a rose? We can no longer find any scientific grounds for preferring one of these laborious products of nature to another. They are different solutions, but each equivalent to the next. One spoke on the wheel as good as any other spoke. No one of the lines appears to lead anywhere in particular. End of quote. But continuing with Teilhard's view. Science in its development, and even as I shall show, mankind in its march is marking time at this moment because men's minds are reluctant to recognize that evolution 
has a precise orientation and a privileged axis. Weakened by this fundamental doubt, the forces of research are scattered and there is no determination to build the earth. Still, he writes, I believe I can see a direction and a line of progress for life, a line and a direction which are in fact so well marked that I am convinced their reality will be universally admitted by the science of tomorrow. End of quote. So as we can see, in the face of the withering destruction of the very notion of progress that is still popular within science today, Teilhard asserted that nature is moving erratically and haltingly perhaps, but nonetheless moving towards higher and higher forms of consciousness. This movement is most apparent in the evolution of the human species. It is humanity in particular, which has a clear concept of nature and of nature's inner workings. Teilhard quotes Julian Huxley approvingly when he said, humanity is nothing else than evolution becoming conscious of itself. End of quote. The specific insights that come into the foreground of awareness as one reflects upon the ascent of this species are both its uniqueness and its relatedness to the whole of the natural world. For Teilhard, the most sublime product of evolution is, of course, the human person. The individual, uniquely aware of itself as a person, yet also aware of its interdependence within the whole. Teilhard would, would agree with Stephen Jay Gould up to a point. One cannot talk scientifically about the superiority of, hu of the human race. One cannot separate the creation of humanity from the creation of other life forms, as many creations attempt to do. Humanity did not emerge by fiat of an all-powerful God. On the contrary, our origin and ascent follow the same path taken by all the creatures that, we, that share life with us on this planet. Human consciousness, including a consciousness of God, is the culmination of nature's own movement through time. It is emergent. Far from being imposed upon the formless face of the natural world, God emerges from nature as its final goal and purpose. Thus, science and religion are brought together in a direct dialect dialectical relation. Teilhard states, states this argument most succinctly in the closing of his great book, The Phenomenon of Man. Quote, to outward appearance, the modern world was born of an anti-religious movement, man becoming self-sufficient and reason supplanting belief. Our generation and the two that preceded it have heard little but talk of conflict between science and faith. Indeed, it seemed at one moment as a foregone conclusion that the former was destined to take the place of the latter. After the close of two centuries of passionate struggles, neither science nor faith has succeeded in discrediting its adversary. On the contrary, it becomes obvious that neither can develop normally without the other. And the reason is simple, the same life animates both. Neither in its impetus nor its achievements can science go to its limits without becoming tinged with mysticism and charged with faith. End of quote. A science tinged with mysticism and charged with faith. Are these words simply respotic, respotic and metaphorical? Not for Teilhard. As a practicing research scientist, he saw the evolution of human personhood not as an exception to the general rules of nature, nor as a freak occurrence without relevance to other living things. He saw the phenomenon of man as an arrow pointing to the final goal and purpose of the universe itself. Can we get my two um, slides up here now of the... 
graphics. Okay, there's one. And, oops. Okay, there's the other. Growing from the same soil that has given rise to all the other phenomena of life, human consciousness and human personality appear to stand at the very top of the tree of life in Teilhard's view. If one were to project the forward edge of evolution into the future, especially as it falls increasingly under human direction and control, then it makes increasing sense to talk of a higher consciousness as being the inherent end and purpose of evolution. Such notions would drive Stephen Jay Gould totally up the wall. If evolution itself points toward a form of consciousness which has personality, perhaps God should be seen as the goal toward which this universe is moving. Hence, the deep affinity which Teilhard felt between science and religion. Quote, there is less difference than people think between research and adoration. Religion and science are the two conjugated faces or phases of one and the same act of complete knowledge. End of quote. Teilhard illustrates these concepts in his image of the cone that is reproduced in front of you. When human beings turn their powers of analysis upon the diversity and multiplicity of life at the base of the cone, this is pure science. However, when humanity turns its powers of synthesis toward the summit, toward the totality and the future, at the pinnacle of the, po of the cone, that is theology. Yet science finds its fulfillment only as it turns from investigation and analysis towards synthesis. That is to say, seeing the totality of life and weighing its character, testing the relationship of the part to the whole. Likewise, those who engage in the search for God find their fulfillment only as they see God who is available in the material world. A faith which is cut loose from the world is likely to be illusory and unreal. Conversely, the faith that truly counts is one that takes science as a fellow traveler in its search for the holy. In the past, Teilhard argues, theologians tended to see God as a supreme being, standing over and apart from the material world. In his view, God dwelt upon the high and remote plane of pure spirit, and therefore the way of salvation was to be lifted above the contradictions of the material realm into a higher spiritual plateau. Teilhard writes, quote, Since Aristotle, there have been almost continual attempts to construct models of God on the lines of the outside prime mover. The high and all-powerful God of traditional theology can influence the world only by intervening in its natural processes and contradicting its natural laws. In fact, many theologians delineate a crystal clear line of demarcation between the natural and the supernatural. The chief signs of God's action in the world are taken to be those otherwise inexplicable events, apparently contradicting all reasonable explanation. Obviously, this concept of God is still very much with us. In popular conception, the most sure and certain sign of God's presence is to be found in those startling and unusual coincidences and occurrences that seem to defy all human understanding. A cancer victim suddenly goes into remission, despite clear indication from medical authorities that death is imminent. The popular imagination has been trained through centuries of religious instruction to see God's appearance in the world as, by definition, an exception, a most unnatural and unusual event. Correspondingly, all hope for future and complete 
communion with God lies in escape from the material world, which is, of course, possible only after death. Thus, one looks for a closer understanding of God by moving in a vertical direction, as illustrated on the chart. One does not progress in life by moving forward in time on the horizontal scale, but by escaping the contradictions of time and history in the eternal. It is precisely such a notion of salvation which has been seen as completely antithetical to science. A supernatural God can only be understood in scientific terms as arbitrary and capricious, as Stephen Jay Gould uh, reminds us. It is not so much that scientists have locked God out of history. The breach has resulted as much from the sincere attempt of religious people to see God as perfect both in power and knowledge as well as love. Yet only a God who is removed from the ambiguities of life as we know it can be perfect. As Stephen Jay Gould rightly insists, such a perfect God could not have created an imperfect world for such an active, an active creation would have been completely out of character. In the meantime, as theologians tended to define God more and more in terms of the supernatural, science has taken its stand in the material world and in nature. In the years since Darwin, scientists have seen human life evolving in a linear march through time on the horizontal scale. As the theologians defended God by building walls around the domain of the spirit, so science dug its trenches in the world of matter. Marx's dialectical materialism and his atheism are together the logical consequences of supernaturalism in religion. Scientific atheism is, in fact, the inevitable consequences of a theology which insists that the knowledge of God must defy human understanding. When theologians insist that knowledge of God can only come through a miraculous act of divine revelation rather than being discovered by reason, or that sinful humanity has no hope of salvation except by fiat of an all-powerful God, then the dialogue between science and religion is interrupted prematurely. Moreover, religion has no role to play in a world which is committed finally and forever to science. That, Teilhard argues, is the greatest theological tragedy of the modern age, and it is still playing itself out in our time in the 21st century. Teilhard's modest proposal, I put quotations around the word, word modest, for the resolution of this dilemma is to chart a new course for both theology and science. This is where we turn to the chart on my left and your right. If religion has seen its purpose as raising human life to higher consciousness in a vertical dimension, and if science has seen its purpose in moving humanity forward on a horizontal plane within the boundaries of the material world, the obvious frontier of consciousness involves a movement both upwards and forwards. Again, Teilhard offered this simple diagram to depict his agenda for the evolution of human consciousness. All of which brings us back to the beginning. The question of how Teilhard would have seen the development of nanotechnology and other digital phenomenon of the 21st century. As my chart suggests, Teilhard's entire frame of thought is premised upon an affirmation of human progress, not only in the purely technical realm, but also in the realm of consciousness. He did not see an intrinsic conflict between science and religion, but rather affirmed both science and spirituality were essential ingredients of any real human progress. Perhaps the most radical aspect of his thought was his insight that God resides not so much at the origin of the universe, at the Big Bang, but at its destination, the Omega Point. God is, in fact, the destination toward which the universe is inexorably moving. 
drawn as if by an unseen force toward the omega point in which all things cohere. In this relentless march toward the future, he would have seen nanotechnology, like the sciences and technologies of the 20th century, as playing an indispensable role. I believe he would have been thrilled to learn of the entire notion of cyberspace, of virtual reality, and of those technologies that make the transition from the merely theoretical to the real. Remember that however mystical and theological his imagination was, his work was equally grounded in the material world, the world of rocks and trees, plants and animals. In his life as well as his work, he exemplified that holistic vision that is clearly the key to our future. Still, a word of caution is in order in conclusion. For like the technology that paved the way toward the splitting of the atom, atomic energy, as well as atomic and nuclear weapons, nanotechnology has the same potential to serve purposes that are destructive as well as creative, evil as well as good. Hence the need for the qualifying adjective, what the world needs now is a geoethical nanotechnology. Technology that is guided both in its development as well as its application by a sense of the sacred world and a commitment to human thriving that in the deepest possible sense. With that critical qualification, Teilhard would have been thrilled by the technologies of our 21st century, especially that of nanotechnology. I'd like to now open it for any questions that have might arisen. Charles, if you click your chat box on the lower left side of your screen, then okay. all the chat will maintain being up so you can read. Whoops, I just turned my chat off. Checking. Okay, it's on our chat box on the lower left of the screen. Hmm. And the viewer that I'm using, the chat box only turns chat on or off. It turns a voice on or off. Do you see the question in the chat box? The box that says chat on it only turns uh, my voice on and off. I'm on the old Second Life. I'm on the Second Life viewer. Okay, what I'll do then is I will read any questions to you that come through the okay. chat box. First okay, question. Correct. First question. As a member of the clergy, when were you first drawn to or inspired by Teilhard de Jardin and his work? Uh, way back when I was in college as an undergraduate, because I was uh, equally um, drawn in by the study of physics as well as the study of religion. And uh, that was way back in the 1960s. And Teilhard, of course, had died just recently, but his works were out there. Um, and I happened to read them, and I saw that here was a person who could uh, connect both my interest in science and my interest in um, theology. So I didn't have to choose one or the other. I could continue to pursue both. Okay, next question. Why does the Catholic Church and the current or recent Pope so eagerly now accept Teilhard's writings? I'm not sure that the Catholic Church does eagerly accept uh, Teilhard's writings. Uh, that good news had not been uh, received by me. I think that he's still regarded as a heretic and actually probably should be because his ideas, when you compare them to Orthodox Catholic theology, are clearly heretical. Then, and they're also, by the way, heretical according to uh, the ideas of my own church. I happen to be a Presbyterian, and uh, his ideas are pretty radical even today. But if somebody knows about Teilhard's uh, writing having him been embraced by 
the Vatican. Let me know about it because I'd like to read more about that. I think the basic problem is that Teilhard saw the material world as the primary source of revelation. Whereas in most of traditional theology, both Catholic and Protestant, uh, the world is regarded as fallen and one receives revelation by a, a miraculous intervention of God into the natural world and a disruption of the natural process uh, like a voice coming out of heaven, not from, certainly not from an object in nature and not from a, another human. Um, Charles, uh, if I could just uh, interject here. Teilhard's writings were placed on the uh, Index of Forbidden Books in 1962. Okay. And uh, okay. it was never, they were never really formally lifted, but more recently, uh, Pope Francis uh, used a bit of Teilhard in his new encyclical, and Benedict and, and John Paul II both referred to Teilhard through various writings, but no one had, no Pope has really uh, um, allowed Teilhard to come back fully into the church as a bona fide theologian or, or scholar or writer. So um, he's still lurking somewhere on the margins with regard to the Catholic right, Church. Right. His influence is uh, profound even upon people who do not recognize where the influence came from. Right. Okay, Charles, Michael Denon asks, the picture of evolution moving toward God, do you also see a God at the beginning as well? Oh, yes, I, I do see God at the beginning. I think T.R. did. Uh, but very few people, I, th I, think mo I think the vast majority of uh, people, in, certainly in popular cultures, uh, have somehow connected the notion of the Big Bang and the Christian theological notion of creation, and they have connected them in time. And things are sequential, moving from, quote, God's creation toward a future which is unknown. They don't think of God as residing in the future and drawing us toward that omega point, which is our destination, so much as they think of God pushing us through time from the past. Shifting the metaphor to a God in the future, alongside the God who is in the past, above and below, um, I think is, it adds to the richness of our conception of God in a great way. Not, not by replacing the notion of God at the origin, but by supplementing it with the notion of God at the, at, the, at, at the end, the omega point. The alpha and the omega, equally important. Okay, next question, Charles. Stephen Jay Gould, as you stated, was a, is a public advocate of Darwin. How much of his writings... Is do you believe have had an ill effect on Taylor's work or writings? Um, I'm not really sure that um, those who love Teilhard would be seriously discouraged by Stephen Jay Gould, but it certainly um, it certainly stirred up a lot of of uh, thinking. Maybe maybe it's good to have your work continually continue to inspire controversy even so long after you've died. I mean, Stephen Jay Gould uh, sort of did his dissection of Teilhard in around 1980, I believe it was, uh, when uh, Teilhard died in 1955. I think the interesting thing is that uh, even so long after his death, Teilhard was getting under the skin of somebody like Gould so much so that he would spend so much energy trying to prove that he was a fraud and his theories were uh, not only uh, unfounded in science, but that he was one of the co-conspirators in, in that uh, controversy of Piltdown Man. So one needs to do a sort of a Freudian analysis of Stephen Jay Gould, why he put, he put so much energy into the debate against an opponent who wasn't alive to, to respond.
Okay, does okay. anyone else have any questions for uh, Reverend Charles Henderson before he takes his seat? Takes his seat. Okay, thanks you all for inviting me here, and I was uh, it was a pleasure to uh, talk about some of these ideas, and I look forward to the rest of your conference. Sister Elia, you Elia must hit the speak button speak. because your speaker is engaged. Oh, sorry about that. Um, no problem. That's why I'm here. Okay, I would like to introduce. Michael Denon, PhD, Professor of Physics and Astronomy from the University of California at Irvine, with his title pres his presentation entitled Emergent Phenomenon, the Geosphere, and the Fullness of Reality, an Intersection of Science and Faith. Okay. Um, hopefully people can hear me. Is yes. that working, Lori? Okay. Well, first of all, that was an exciting first talk, and I'm very glad that Reverend Charles was able to actually give a nice, a good introduction and overview of Teilhard because I was feeling really guilty that I didn't include him much in my talk. Um, I also shortened the title a little in going to the PowerPoint to just some of the key words, emergent phenomena and the fullness of reality. And I'm glad that the earlier talk referenced some of these ideas, particularly the idea of emergence, um, just to give you a little bit of background of where I'll be coming from and what I hope to talk about. Um, mostly what I'd like to do is try and raise some questions, hopefully have some good discussion maybe at the end, but bring in thoughts from physics. Um, I am a professor of physics and astronomy. Um, I've been at UC Irvine for 18 years now. Uh, I'll have some fun in the middle and show you some pictures from my research, uh, but I'd also like to um, present thoughts from my own faith journey. Um, I am Catholic, raised and, and born, um, but my mother is also, my mother's Jewish, so I'm technically Jewish as well. And I think the two intersections between my physics and my faith have been quite productive in my life. And I've, I've loved the writings and thoughts of Teilhard as a scientist and a person of faith. And having, I guess, gone to a Jesuit high school, that gives me even other ties to him as a Jesuit. So let me begin by just oops, clicking on here. The questions. So one of the reasons questions interest me so much is that they really are both, I think, the key to the effort of science, but also the key to the faith journey and the key to thinking about the world around us. And ultimately, as has been kind of mentioned before, going forward, some of the ethical issues that science can raise. And when we think about science, really, it's not just about asking the right questions, it's also about asking the right type of questions. Science, by its construction and definition, does experiments that are reproducible and repeatable. And we have to be able to ask questions about which you can design such experiments. And one of the challenges for science, and one of the challenges we face, is not all questions can be answered in this way. And so it really you know, raises the question to me often of how do we get at other ways of knowing things about the world around us and about reality. And one obvious area is ethical questions. Uh, you know, what does it take to answer ethical questions? Can it be done from a purely scientific perspective? And in this presentation, I'd like to focus on two or three what I consider really big questions. And they were mentioned a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, in the earlier talk, and it has to do with, I think, the nature of reality. I really liked the um, discussion of Teilhard's view of understanding about God and revelation coming from a study of the physical world, but I do think, as was also mentioned, there's much interest in what is traditionally called the supernatural, but I think that's a very loaded word and has a lot of different images for people. So I'd like to suggest a different, world, a different word for now, which is what I'm going to call non-physical reality. And you'll see what I mean by that as I go on in the talk. So one of the main questions, really, I think, is the question of what constitutes reality. 
what is, is it just the physical world? The, what, I, what was referred to earlier is, I think, militant skepticism, and really, I think, um, what I would call extreme atheism, is this idea that the only thing that exists is the purely physical that can be measured through science. And one of the things I liked about Teilhard de Chardin is the beginning, bringing together of the mystical and the physical, particularly when talking about things like the body of Christ. But I would also like to propose in my thinking about what are the interesting questions that underline our conversations and underline a lot of what is being discussed is, is a deeper question that doesn't get a lot of press, which is the question of free will. For me as a physicist, when you look at our physical theories of the world, they are fundamentally deterministic. And I know quantum mechanics often comes up, and I'm going to throw in a little bit about that later. Um, but even that is fundamentally deterministic, and I'll define determinism a little bit later, but basically it means that everything is completely determined from the initial conditions. And I think in this era, there is still a lot of focus and discussion for whatever reason in the public media about evolution and evolution as this battleground between science and religion, which for me, people like Teilhard and a lot of modern thinkers really have dispelled and is when I talk with scientist friends say from Europe it's not really as much of a controversy or concern for them it seems to be a fairly American question at times and I would like to suggest that we're discussion and focused on evolution is a bit of a distraction from some more interesting and challenging questions so let's kind of see where that will take us I, I like to start by pointing out something that may seem a little silly, and that is that reality exists. I, I, I remember in college being a little confused and frustrated by philosophy, part of the reason I ended up a physicist, but I think it's interesting that really one thing almost everybody can agree on is that some form of reality exists. Even if, I, I find giving a talk in Second Life is particularly useful for this analogy. Here we are not seeing each other, looking at each other's avatars. Um, the avatars can move and react and do things. My avatar is doing very interesting things right now, independent of me putting its hands on its hips. But the avatar is not my reality in one sense. My reality is me sitting here at my computer giving the talk. But the fact that the avatar is doing something, you all know some reality exists. Maybe it's the avatar, maybe it's the person behind the computer, Maybe me sitting here in my office is simply a computer program for someone else. These are what I consider kind of the fun, um, as a professor of mine once said, sitting in the pub drinking a beer discussions. But at the end of the day, we do know reality exists. And I think from the scientific enterprise, we take physical reality quite seriously. And what I mean by that is the world that we can measure with our five senses. Every science experiment is an experiment and study using the senses or equipment we build to expand our senses and make more accurate measurements. But there really is this question of, is there a deeper, fuller, or more broader reality, something that goes beyond the physical reality? And I think science points to one that we have to take very seriously, and I will come back to that later on. For me, I think arguably the most fundamental question that doesn't get a lot of press is this question of free will. Because we're going to come to this idea of emergence and emergent property and consciousness as, emergence as an emergent property of, of matter, which is something I think from a scientific point of view is relatively easy to understand. But it's not clear to me that free will is also something one can understand purely from emergence from the physical world. And it is yet something that we take as well established. Uh, basically, everything we do in society, from making people responsible for their actions uh, in our own lives, we have this perception and assumption of choice. We also know our choice is limited. There's not absolutely anything that we can do. We can't suddenly try to fly. We can in second life, but we can't in the real what we call the real world. There's also obviously things that are set based on our past and our trajectory, but not everything is set, we believe. We believe we can make choices and change our future. And why I view this as a very interesting question, going back to Teilhard, 
and some of his thoughts is, what is our real role in evolution? If the world is totally and completely deterministic, then what we're doing now is just the result of the laws of physics and the random motion of molecules. We have no control over it, and therefore we also have no control over evolution. But there is a very real sense that once you have consciousness with free will, and that is the key point we have to keep in mind, without actual choice, then we do not actually influence our own evolution. It's central to that enterprise. And that's why I consider this issue of free will such an important question. So I do want to do a quick physics aside because it is an area I, I study and focus on, and that is emergence. And I like to always give an example when I talk about emergence. It's a common word to use. It's often used in regard to things like the emergence of consciousness. But I like to take a step back and ask an interesting question about shaving cream, or what we like to call foam, which is gas bubbles with liquid walls. The question is, is it a solid or is it a liquid? Most people are familiar with shaving cream. Um, hopefully you've seen it and used it. And the idea of this question of it being a solid or a liquid ultimately comes down to your perspective and the scale at which you look at the behavior. So if I look at the molecules in a foam, Every single molecule in there is in what we call a fluid state. It's a gas or a liquid. The molecules are free to move. They can move around each other. The substances can flow. This is very clearly a liquid. But if I look at shaving cream at the macroscopic scale of the shaving cream in my hand, it is very clearly has the properties of a solid. It holds its shape. I can squeeze it into my hand and it will hold its shape on its own. Um, it's stiff. It has what we call an elastic modulus. It can vibrate. I can shake it and it will vibrate. Now, if I push it hard enough, it starts to behave like a liquid again. It flows. That's how I spread it on my face. But you have this substance that from the microscopic scale, from the smallest physics, is a fluid behaving like a solid. This means if I'm a strict reductionist, I would never be able to predict the solid-like behavior. If I'm a reductionist, I say I can understand everything from the scale of the molecules, but the molecules are all liquids, and the foam itself is a solid. This idea of emergence was expressed very well by a Nobel Prize winning physicist Phil Anderson in an article called More is Different, where he talked about the idea that when you have these complex systems at these larger length scales, new physics will emerge. This idea is often also expressed in a, a famous statistical mechanics textbook by Landau and Lifshitz. And it's these new emergence of properties that is often what's connected with consciousness. Um, and we, I want to look at it in the context of free will as we go forward. Now, another example of emergence that's fun to look at because it has ties to evolution is pattern formation. Again, this is simply an excuse to show more of the type of research I do. But the idea here is, and this gets to something, again, that came up in the earlier talk. Um, a lot of people, particularly, you know, biologists and others you hear, when they talk about evolution, focus on the randomness, I, you know, there's no purpose to it, um, which, is more, um, which is more advanced or which is not more advanced. But a lot of these ideas, particularly the ideas of the randomness, come from what we call equilibrium physics. Um, which is we think about entropy and we think about systems being unlikely where and we talk about the probabilities of stuff occurring. Now, pattern formation is an example of studying the behavior of systems that are non-equilibrium. They're driven by an energy source and the macroscopic large-scale behavior leads to spatial organization where the microscopic behavior is random and not the relevant physics. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's just take some simple pictures. It literally is, pattern formation is what it sounds like. It's the formation of patterns. Right now I'm showing you a picture of a simulation, which is on should be on your right, my left, the very large, thick black and white lines. That's a simulation of chemical waves. The other picture is chemical waves, an image of chemical waves in your heart. And you can see the spatial structure of stripes and spirals. Moving forward, you can see a classic picture of stripes on a zebra um, and these hexagon-shaped tops of uh, stone and devil's post pile. Um, you can also go out to larger scales 
And if you look closely at this picture, I don't know how well it shows up on these screens, you can see stripes in the clouds. Um, Texas does not actually have an outline from space, but what you see there is where Texas would be drawn on to give you a sense of the size of those stripes. These are convection rolls in clouds in the atmosphere, so the gas in the atmosphere is actually making large um, cylindrical rolls, and as it rolls, it makes the shape of stripes. Now, the molecules in here are all moving randomly, and you would never expect those random motions to lead to these structures. Here you have the great spot on Jupiter, which is an organized structure, and then jumping backwards, back down to the lab, these are pictures um, taken from researchers and labs I've collaborated with. What you're looking at here is fluids being heated from below. So you're looking at it from above. Imagine like a pizza box or a thin layer of fluid in a frying pan. You heat it uniformly from below. There is no um, imposition of the order. Nothing is done to make these stripes, squares, or hexagons. All you do is reach a critical temperature difference. And then the random motions of the molecules, again, end up being these organized roll convection structures that lead to stripes, squares, and hexagons. And if I was to think about this purely from the point of view of the molecules moving randomly, I would never predict these structures. These could not spontaneously arise from just random motions from heat, from thermal motions of particles vibrating and moving in the fluid. What is going on is the physics at the length scale of the entire system. When you heat the system as a whole, the fluid gets less dense and starts to rise. As it rises, it cools and starts to fall again. And the interaction of the rising and falling large chunks of fluid leads to the emergence of ordered structures. So you have a system being fed by energy that goes from a disordered to an ordered structure. And so we have an understanding, therefore, of how this order could arise in the system of the Earth from the source of energy, which in this case happens to be the sun. Now, the Earth is way, way more complicated a system than the fluid systems I'm showing here. But the very basic idea is the same. Energy input in drives you out of what we call equilibrium and leads to the formation of ordered structures. Um, eventually, if you put enough order energy in, you go from ordered to disordered structures again. So these are what we call spatial temporal chaotic structures. Just thought it would be fun to show those pictures. But why do I raise these issues from my research of foams and pattern formation and fluids and stripes and zebras and a discussion of things like consciousness, evolution, free will, and the connection between God and reality. Well, first, it's, I think, useful to re use these to remind ourselves that often when we think of consciousness and we think of it from a scientific and material explanation as an emergent from the physical world and an emergent property, we have to keep in mind that the emergence that we're talking about is the behavior at the complex structure of the neurons and the new length scales. But the neurons themselves are not the key physical entity. The fact that your brain is made of neurons that are interacting in a certain way is probably not the fundamental physics explanation of consciousness. Just like I showed you patterns occurring in zebras, in clouds above the earth, in fluid in the lab, um, and in a wide range of systems, the physics laws that we use to describe those are independent of the material in which the pattern formation is occurring, but they have much more to do with the global structures of the fact that there's energy being inputted, that there's a spatial extent and spatial interactions, on these other general features. And so when we think about consciousness, yes, it happened to have emerged on this planet initially within neurons and brains and human beings, but the, as I will come to again at the end, we shouldn't assume that that's the only physical or only structure in which consciousness can emerge. Now, I want to jump back to free will. So in my mind, Consciousness does seem to be able to be understood in terms of an emergent property from the physical world. 
I'll talk a little bit more near the end and some other thoughts I have on that. But free will seems to be a bit more challenging. And for me, that has to do with the question of how deterministic is the physical world really. And I heard once a great quote about quantum mechanics, and unfortunately I forgot who said it, so I can't give them proper credit. But the quote was, there are many complicated and confusing things in the world, and just because quantum mechanics is complicated and confusing doesn't mean it explains everything. And quantum mechanics is often quoted as an explanation for things, and I have thought about it in, my, in the past and even now, and I've heard people often think about isn't quantum mechanics perhaps a way to understand free will? We're very familiar often with the idea that classical or Newtonian mechanics that's used to describe the motion of particles and baseballs and um, us and the world around us is deterministic, meaning if I know the initial conditions, I can predict the future. But doesn't quantum mechanics have randomness and fundamentally probabilistic, so then it's a way out? Well... To me, I get nervous about quantum mechanics being a way out in a very direct way for this question of free will and choice. Um, and part of it comes from understanding, you have to understand where is the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. I just want to do a very short quantum mechanics aside, and this may be too quick to be useful, but we'll try it. When we think about quantum mechanics, the reason quantum mechanics is fundamentally different than what we're used to in terms of our normal description of physical reality, is if I were to ask you to describe what's going on right now, for instance, in this room where we're having the conference or where you are sitting, you would describe things in terms of where people are, what they're moving, how they're moving, and where they're going. Like I would say right now, you're sitting in your chairs not moving. I would talk about your position and your velocity. And this is the way we're used to thinking about the world. That's how we describe the state of anything. Now, in contrast, in quantum mechanics, when we describe the state of something, we don't talk about where it is and where it's moving. We talk about its wave function, which is the state of the system, and it represents the probability of measuring other properties of the system, such as its energy or where it is or where it's moving. Now, the state of the system in classical mechanics evolves deterministically. If I give you the initial positions and velocities, I know what they are at all future times. In quantum mechanics, the same thing is true for the state of the system. If I give you the current state, which is the wave function, which allows you to predict the probabilities of measurements, it evolves deterministically in time. There really is no probability or uncertainty there. Simply what happens is when I try and make a measurement, my predictions about the world will involve probabilities. But, and there is an uncertainty there, but it's not clear to me that there is any sense in which that uncertainty can actually connect to the concept of having true choice and influencing things in a fundamental way. However, and I think this is an important feature of quantum mechanics, which is going to try, I'm going to now try and conclude my meandering, wandering, and bring it back um, to the beginning. When we look at the wave function from a physics point of view, my first early question was, is there any non-physical reality? Physical reality is easy to define. It's that reality which we measure with our five senses or with our equipment that we can use to probe that. It turns out the wave function can't be measured directly. When I mentioned it, it is the fundamental reality that we believe in quantum mechanics. It is real. There's ways we can show that it exists. It's not just a mathematical construct. And yet, it's what we call a complex number. It is not something you ever measure directly. What you measure is the probabilities predicted by the wave function, which you get by doing a mathematical operation, which is taking the wave function and taking it's modulus squared. What that means is that you can indirectly know about the reality of the wave function. You can indirectly get at it, but it is not something you directly measure with physics. And I find this a very, very intriguing idea because it points to the fact that we have to take the non-physical seriously alongside the physical and ask questions about the full reality that both embody.
And so I think, I hope, and I know these were kind of a random walk through various thoughts, but I wanted to, like I said, pose questions mostly and not answers. So one of the questions is this idea of life, consciousness, free will, are they an accident or are they purpose? And is there a direction and a purpose to this? So now I'll return to my brief aside into pattern formation. I, I made this little chart. I don't know if it will make a lot of sense, but let's just talk about a few things. Um, on the bottom axis, there's this thing called R with an RC. This is being used to describe the parameter that measures the amount of energy we're inputting into a system. On the vertical axis is um, just spatial size and extent. And what I want to, you to get out of this is go back. Here's the convection. Look for the word convection on the chart. That's the formation of those first patterns and stripes. The idea is if there's not much energy going into the system, stuff is moving around randomly, that's equilibrium. You won't get any spontaneous structures. The probability of measuring them is zero. If you increase this driving force, the input of energy, beyond the critical point, if you were to just compute probabilities based on the random motions of the molecules, you would still get a probability of zero of seeing a pattern. But when you understood it from the appropriate level of physics, which is the, at the level of the pattern formation, you would see that the probability is one of getting a pattern. There is no choice. The system would generate it no matter what you do. So given that, you know, in equilibrium systems, we have a certain set of physics that tells us about maximum entropy, minimizing energy, that gives you one set of understanding it. Once the system is non-equilibrium, once it's being driven by an energy source, in this case a temperature difference for heating a fluid, you get a different answer, and the correct answer turns out to be that you get a pattern every time. So that, I think, naturally brings us to the question, and brings us back to some of Teilhard's ideas about evolution. In, in a world, in a universe, where we're on a planet that's being driven by an input of energy from the sun, I would argue that if we reach the point where we can understand the physics correctly of the full complex system, we would see that instead of life being viewed as random chance that we got lucky, and the same with consciousness, that the parameters, the actual, phys the relevant physical parameters from our planet, guarantee life and consciousness. So then the next question really for me is, moving forward at this point, as we know consciousness exists, I think that's something we all experience and can agree on, my question would be, what is the role in all of this of free will? Are we active agents going forward? Does consciousness come along with free will? I would answer yes. Um, is free will itself an emergent physical property, or is it something that points to another aspect of non-physical reality that we interact with. And to me, that's why free will is such a central question in all of this. Because, again, of this understanding that the laws of physics, even at these levels of, say, emergent behavior, are still fundamentally deterministic. Is there something else going on? And I just want to kind of end with an image um, that I've come to really like, which God as the fullness or is the ultimate reality, and go back briefly um, to bring in evolution a bit. I, I always feel, you know, as mentioned in the earlier talk, um, God at the beginning and the big bang versus moving towards God at the end. And I love that image, God, both at the beginning and the end and all, throughout the whole thing. I think one of the reasons we're still debating and discussing evolution versus creationism is a, is a poor image of creator and poor images and analogies for creation. So I just want to conclude with hopefully bringing some of these ideas back together with an, another image or metaphor for God or for creation, and that is the child growing in the mother's womb. Uh, when we think, and, and this was mentioned earlier in the other talk, this idea of the supernatural God separate from the world, pulling it into existence. Um, and I think that is a challenge for theology, the separateness of God and creation, whereas an integrated vision that includes, here I think, this is why I like the metaphor of the child growing in the mother's room, and I'll let you read the slide, but you can see that with this 
image of growth and evolution within a fuller reality, you can bring together all of the scientific ideas related to um, evolution. You can bring in the full idea of the way science works within the physical world and being able to measure physical reality. And you can bring in this larger question of embedded in a physical reality. How is it that we're able to access and understand the non-physical? And to me, that I would, I would agree with Teilhard's statements and the statements made in the earlier talk that the physical world is where we get a large amount of our revelation and understanding about God um, and is where we learn it. But I would suspect because of the way I think about and have thought about recently free will, the way I think about the non-physical reality, there is a sense in which um, interaction between physical and non-physical reality is something we have to think about, try and understand, and take seriously, and that I believe there probably is a place for both types of revelation, um, what I might call insight or inspiration, as well as experimentation and the careful scientific process. And for me, one of my other favorite images is the body of Christ, both the mystical and physical body. And I like to just kind of conclude with a thought, you know, going back again through my random walk of questions and, and um, answers, if the complexity of a brain leads to consciousness, beings that can think, and the complexity of a brain leads to beings that love, it seems kind of interesting that the natural conclusion wouldn't be that the complexity that is the fullness of reality with all its interactions and um, spatial structures and complexity wouldn't lead to actually a consciousness and a fullness of reality that loves fully. So that's a very exciting image for me. It's a very exciting thought. Um, and then to tie it back a little bit, again, to the, the theme of this and the geoethics of going forward, you know, understanding our role in this and what we can and cannot influence is critical as we move forward with the challenging and interesting technologies that nanotechnology and digital technology represent. And I, I have to end with a shameless plug and final advertisement um, that on October 1st, I will actually have a book that hopefully does more justice to these ideas and questions than the short time I had here. But I wanted to be short so that we had time for questions. So thank you very much for listening to this talk. Um, hopefully it wasn't too much of a random walk and it made some sense. And I look forward to the rest of the conference. For those of you who came in a little bit late after the conference started, Q&A is limited to the chat box only. So I see Lori's question here. Um, what, from my Judeo-Christian upbringing, most influenced your desire to become a physicist? You know, it's interesting. What most desire, influenced my desire to become a physicist was wanting to travel to outer space. <laughs> um, but early on, and I still have memories of this, um, being very, very excited as I was learning about evolution um, as a kid and just understanding it, because as many kids who became scientists was, I was fascinated with dinosaurs. Um, and thinking about, to me, how obvious it was that, for instance, the, the story of creation in the Bible was a story of increasing order and a story of evolution and basically a mythical version. I, I didn't have the sophistication to think in terms of that word, but a, myth, a mythical version of what we were learning through science. And I found that idea very exciting. Um, and I think it's also just, from the Judeo-Christian point of view, the part of it is just the whole idea of salvation history, to me, is the idea of an evolutionary process. And so it just matches so well with the scientific endeavor.
Um, so I like, is there a reality you believe equally as physical as it is spiritual? Uh, as I said, what, what, if you notice in the talk, I tended to avoid the word spiritual uh, and supernatural, not because I don't necessarily find those useful in many contexts, but they are um, very loaded words. And I do think um, that there is a very, very real, what I would call non-physical reality. And when I put on my scientist hat, I use that term specifically because of my views on, you know, the way science works, our goal is to do experiments, and we can do it through our five senses and through measurements and our measurement devices. And in the last year or two, what I've been intrigued with is the question of, is there any equivalent of a scientific experiment that we can do when it comes to the non-physical experiences. So what people would call mystical experiences or spiritual experiences or supernatural. One of the challenges, I think, for that endeavor is, unfortunately, there are too many examples of what would be called spiritual or supernatural experiences that are either outright hoaxes on purpose or fake, and those get a lot of press. And so it gives that area a lot of negative press and negative news, which makes it a little harder, I think, at times to ask serious scientific questions about it. But it's an interesting problem. And there's a similar problem just in general, which is in most of physics and, and, and science, you probe systems by poking them from the outside. So when I talked about studying the foam, we poke it from outside the foam to see its behavior. If I was the size of a molecule stuck inside foam, I could only detect the molecular environment I was in, and I would conclude I'm in a fluid. I'm um, going back to, this is why I like to always bring up the example of foams in talks like this. If I want to pro probe the full nature of the foam and find out that it's different, I have to be outside of it. So if we really want to understand the, all the properties and the fullness of the physical reality we inhabit first, there's an interesting scientific challenge to that in that we don't ever exist outside of reality to probe it and poke it. We have to do experiments from within. So we have to think carefully about what that means from a scientific point of view. And then we add this added dimension of the spiritual, the non-physical. I personally believe it's very real. I think that is what a lot of inspiration and human experience comes from. But I don't know exactly how one would carefully study it or convince others of its reality. As I mentioned, I think there are places now in science that point to other realities, and quantum mechanics and the wave function points to it, to my mind, in an interesting way. I hope that answered the question. Ah, so <laughs> Laurie asked about um, anything Teo Dushan related comes up within period, my appearances on shows like on the History Channel show, The Ancient Aliens. You know, that's interesting. That's an interesting show to be involved in um, because its focus is on things that happened in the past. And that's even more of a challenge when it comes to these areas. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't really find any connections there with that. To me, that show and my presence on it and my role is much more connected to what I've talked about, just how science actually works, requiring repeatable um, and reproducible exper experiments. And when talking about things that happened in the past, it is very hard to imagine repeatable, experience, um, repeatable experiments. So there is science you can do about the past. Obviously, we do paleontology, and, and that is something that Teilhard was very big in, um, but there's a, a level of, of speculation that occurs on, on, I think, a lot of the aspects in the History Channel that really isn't scientific, but that's okay. It, it certainly is kind of fun, um, and, I, and I respect the interest in the questions that get raised, um, but I do think the, the, you know, the type of work that Teilhard did and um, what we would consider sort of the scientific efforts 
tends to focus and keep the questions narrowed into the areas as to what the experiments can actually say. Does anyone else have a question for Michael Denon? If not, I did want to make a comment, Michael, that you sure. said earlier sure. you cannot predict a solid-like behavior, although you probably could have predicted that I solidly enjoyed your presentation. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay. It was a pleasure to be here. This was very exciting. I look forward to seeing these on the web. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, that thought-provoking presentation, indeed. I'll look at physics a little differently now, I think. <laughs> Good. Okay, our next speaker is our keynote, Sister Elia Delio, author of From Teilhard to, o Teilhard to Omega, Co-Creating an Unfinished Universe. She's also the Director of Catholic Studies at Georgetown University. Let's welcome Sister Ilya to the podium. So thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentations so far. And um, I'm going to begin in the sense where Charles Henderson began, and that's just talking a little bit about uh, this amazing person, Teilhard de Chardin, because I think he really is a prophet and a mystic, uh, as well as a scientist. Um, just as a young boy, just to recap, he was, uh, he was very, he grew up in a very mountainous area in um, France and was always keenly interested in, in the material things of life, especially in rocks and stones. And so he was drawn to the uh, natural world from a very young age. Um, he entered the Jesuits, and I want to say that this is his formation as person, as, as a scientist and as a Jesuit priest, um, is, makes for this unique synthesis of his thought. Uh, he did his um, Jesuit training uh, first in France, but then in Egypt because of the situation in France, and eventually was sent to Cairo, Egypt, to, to teach uh, and continue his formation. He was, as... Um, Charles Henderson pointed out, he was very influenced by the French philosopher Henri Bergson, uh, much more than Charles Darwin. So I do not see Teilhard as a Darwinian biologist, but he is more of a, a Bergsonian um, biologist philosopher. And of course, Bergson's um, great insight but, um, along the lines of process thinking, there's a vital impulse in nature. Um, that accounts for its uh, dynamic change. Teilhard so, yeah, did do his doctoral studies in, at the Sorbonne, and his area of specialty was the Eocene period, about 56 to 34 million years ago. And um, this period is marked by the emergence of the first modern mammals. Uh, and then he was invited in 1923 to join another Jesuit in China for um, research. His uh, period in China was spent um, outside the area of Peking, where um, Father Li Song had built a museum and housed fossils he had collected um, in China. Uh, it was really through these discoveries that Teilhard began to question the doctrine of original sin, and this is uh, really what, in a sense, got him in trouble with the Catholic Church. He uh, wrote a paper on why original sin was not so original, um, or rather, why it was incompatible with what was now known in terms of biological evolution. And this, his essay found its way to Rome, and um, he was ordered to sign a statement repudiating, actually, his ideas on original sin. He tried to uh, reconcile his ideas with the Vatican, but to no avail. He was, um, he uh, was disturbed, but, well, his writings were, in a sense, blocked by French bishops, uh, again, who reported him, and he was eventually silenced. But, believe it or not, it's always periods of suffering, sort of, that create a type of fertile creativity as one tries to explain one's insights um, more coherently, and Teilhard began to introduce concepts of biosphere and newtosphere um, in his explanation why 
original sin was not the most uh, meaningful of doctrines. In any event, Teilhard began to live in an exile, since he was, he was um, not allowed to publish anything of his writings, his spiritual writings, during his lifetime. I think that's important for us to recognize, uh, because he never had the opportunity of critique, uh, a positive criticism, or even negative, to refine his writings. Um, in any event, even though he was placed in exile, uh, sort of a self-imposed exile, he continued his geological expeditions, uh, traveling throughout China and Africa, uh, and was, in 1937, awarded the Gregor Mendel Award for his, um, for his scientific writings by Villanova University, which I'm happy to report. His, probably his most significant piece of writing is his Phenomenon of Man, which he really lays out his entire vision of science and um, biology, or science and religion, rather. Uh, and this is, as others have spoken about, his evolutionary insights on, um, from galactic evolution to Earth evolution, through life evolution and conscious evolution. And he sits, situates um, the emergence of the human as the unifying theme of this emergent process. He continued to develop his spiritual writings, uh, constantly trying to refine his insights, developing more, but um, it really cost him physically and spiritually. Uh, he had several heart attacks, and in May of 1947, he was, um, again, trying to to uh, defend his writings against his crit critics. But he had a heart attack in 1947 that really sort of landed him in a serious state. Uh, just to maybe uh, sum up his life, I should, should just go back there and say that Teilhard died in 1955, rather alone in New York City, surrounded by just not even a handful of Jesuits. And I often wonder if he died feeling more of a failure than a success. Um, however, he did have tremendous insight that we are, the human species is in evolution, uh, and that he thought Christianity is just too, not just simply out of touch, the whole structure of Christianity does not fit the world as science now discloses it to us. So as he wrote in 1948 to his friend George Barber, he said, what a neo-humanism that looks to the future must have is nothing less than a more profound Christianity rethought to fit the new dimensions of the world. And that, in a sense, sums up uh, the whole framework of his spiritual writings. And just to point out maybe some of the relevant writings here of Teilhard to this discussion of nanotechnology and future, um, I would point out his essays in Activation of Energy uh, and his essays in the Future of Man, which I have found very helpful in how Teilhard is was shaping his thought for the future of um, Homo sapiens. Um, of course, his phenomenon of man, human energy, and Christianity and evolution, also extremely insightful writings. And you'll find throughout his writings recurrent themes. He's constantly, uh, in a sense, his writings are like a spiral. He keeps going back over and over themes that he feels are really helpful in forging this new future, but he's constantly trying to clarify them. Um, as we look at his scheme, and, and, and Charles Henderson pointed uh, to this scheme in his conversation, in his presentation, and I really appreciated Michael Dennett's uh, um, presentation as well, because there's, there's a link here in, in what's being said. And maybe this, um, this little scheme sort of sums it up, at least from my perspective. Taylor does see that the natural world is not entirely nature itself. There's something within nature that is not nature, but is indeed deeply imbued in nature and pushing it onward towards something more. He called this principle originally omega, um, first as a principle of centeredness. Now, omega is a term from Revelation. In other words, God you know, says at one point, I am the alpha and the omega. And in a sense, Teilhard is saying that, in a sense, the end, and here by end, we don't mean 
we, uh, when we talk about finality for for Tayer, that means fullness. So the fullness of all things is potentially already within all things because omega is already in alpha or the beginning um, of this universe. <clears throat> he then will um, speak about this omega as God, God omega. And uh, I think, I forget, it might be Charles Henderson who pointed out that while we do live and move and have our being in God, God completely empties God's self into created reality. And that is the incarnational focus of <clears throat> Teilhard's thought. And it's, it's really what we call a mystery or what the medievalists would call a coincidence of opposites, that God is both Alpha and Omega, God is both fullness and emptiness. And this emptying of God into created reality is, of course, the not just the um, basis of creation, but it's what we call incarnation. So they, these um, doctrines of creation and incarnation, Teilhard sees as the, the livingness of divinity in created reality, synthesizing this reality towards greater complexity and greater fullness. He will speak about this process as a type of um, cosmic, what he will call cosmic personalization. And here he is really referring to the fact that evolution is not um, a process where at some point, you know, religion enters in and Jesus comes on the scene. Rather, from the whole beginning of this process, Teilhard sees that the Christ is part and parcel of evolution itself because because God Omega is at the heart of it. So he speaks of the process as Christogenesis or cosmic personalization or the birthing of the Christ. Now, interestingly, Teilhard did not see Christianity as normative of religion. In fact, he really saw that religion um, really is a type of energy or has an animating power. It's not about institution. It's certainly not about uh, uh, juridical laws and norms. It's really about life energies moving towards the fullness of life in God. So he sees that Christianity fulfills an essential function in evolution. And he will, at several points in his writings, speak of Christianity as a religion of evolution, precisely because of its synthesizing nature. And maybe this scheme better um, points up that synthesizing tendency of Christianity. In other words, this omega uh, present from the beginning, empowering it towards something that is more complex, more personal, and what he will call the rise of the Christic, or the Christification of the universe toward um, omega, or toward the fullness. Now, just to point out certain things here, which we'll pick up um, in a few uh, slides down the road. This cosmic personalization is a rise of consciousness, um, it is a rise of love, and it is a rise of wholeness. So he sees that there's something going on in creation, uh, this kind of irreversible trend towards greater consciousness, wholeness, and um, fullness. Now, he realizes that uh, if we are to come to a new understanding of God, we need a new understanding of reality. So I appreciated the remarks of Michael Denon, previous to mine. Um, now, Taylor will look at, uh, he was in touch with the physicists of his day. He was in conversation with some of them. And uh, he, he did, was aware that, you know, reality is largely um, energy. I mean, if we, we talk about quantum reality, we're talking about energy at the heart of life. And what uh, Teilhard realized is that there seems to be a fundamental law of attraction within this uh, cosmic life, uh, the reality of cosmic life. And he speaks of this fundamental law of attraction as, as an attraction that is unitive, that is generative, that is creative. And therefore, he says, he speaks of this as love energy. And he says at one point, he says, um, the force of love energy is present from the Big Bang onward, though indistinguishable from molecular forces. And this could strike, certainly it strikes the ear of the scientist quite funny, or maybe new agey, um, or just maybe irrelevant. But I think Teilhard is really pointing to something very fundamental 
at the heart of life. He's saying that there is a force of attraction that science itself cannot fully explain, but attraction that is um, moving us and undergirding us towards more being and more life. In fact, the term that he uses is not metaphysics, it is hyperphysics. In other words, we are moving towards more being and more life. And just by way of semantics here, um, love, uh, rather evolve, spelled backwards, is love. And I just think it's just um, quite interesting that, you know, if indeed this love energy is at the heart of evolution, it seems to be at the heart of evolutionary life. So, where does this bring us? Um, well, for Teilhard, he is saying that what we are fundamentally, I mean, the scientists can talk about um, the details of quantum mechanics, but from a, from a religious perspective, and maybe from a religious perspective that takes science seriously, Teilhard is saying that the physical structure of the universe is love. And certainly from a religious perspective, if we had taken that seriously about a thousand years ago, rather than the physical structure of the universe being sin, uh, we might be in better shape today. That being said, he sort of develops a philosophy of love. And there, there's only one other philosopher in the 20th century that I know of, um, and that is Max Scheller, who developed a philosophy of love. But neither of these have really been um, fully incorporated to our thinking. By love energy, or, or this kind of philosophy of love, what Taylor is saying is that being is interbeing. Right? To be is to be with. Um, that relationship is, in a sense, part and parcel of the reality of life itself. So that nothing exists in and of its own right. It exists in order that it can share life. Uh, because it is in the sharing of life that, that anything that exists takes on its own personality. And he puts this kind of philosophy of love in the context of evolution, the framework of evolution. It says that we are in a process um, where we are moving toward more complexified life forms. And uh, even as Michael was talking, you know, the idea of emergence, that given sufficient time and the right conditions, that at critical points, new things will happen. And so qualitative differences will emerge. So what we are seeing here, um, certainly in light of Teilhard, is that nature is incomplete, uh, it is open, and it is creative. This, to the religious person, is still a novel idea. Um, certainly, when you look at the Judeo-Christian tradition, even, um, even Islam, we are based on Aristotelian physics and philosophy. And uh, Aristotelian philosophy posits the idea of essay, substance and that the, that essences themselves are fixed. But what Teilhard realizes as a scientist and as, and as an Ignatian um, spiritual writer, nature is consistently oriented toward new and complex life. And of course, um, we know this ourselves today, that we are in uh, evolution now conscious of itself, as uh, other speakers pointed out, that we have moved over a period of 140,000 years or so from 160,000 years from quadruped to biped to various levels of complexity where today we find ourselves now in an evolutionary quandary since we really have no uh, sense of where we're really going. Taylor points out three drivers of evolution as the three drivers as convergence, complexity, or con and consciousness or what we can call the three C's. Um, that things continue to Love energy at the heart of life continues to converge elements of life, that as they converge, they complexify their levels of relationship, degrees of relatedness deepens, and as these degrees of relationships deepen, consciousness rises. So, as he points out, following Julian Huxley, we are not simply in evolution, we are evolution. And uh, I know my technologist friends uh, are quite um, in tune with this insight. But what it means for us, and certainly, you know, for religious people, I think this is still, as I, as I speak to many different groups, um, the idea that as religious, as human beings, religious or not religious, we are still, we are unfinished, and we are incomplete. That means life is open 
to, to being created up ahead. And creativity is at the heart of life itself. Um, and that is, in a sense, how life evolves, even what science is telling us today, that create the creative power within um, is, in a sense, one of the fundamental drivers of evolution itself. Tenured, and this becomes very interesting. You know, he is a biologist, uh, he is a scientist, but uh, that's why I found Michael Denon's concluding comments quite interesting, because... For Teilhard, evolution is the rise of consciousness. In other words, consciousness is not an epiphenomenon. It's certainly not a discrete human phenomenon. It is within the material universe from the Big Bang onward. And Teilhard will speak of two types of energy in evolution. A type of energy that he calls radial energy, which is the energy of transcendence, an energy that's pulling us forward, and an energy that he calls tangential energy, or the energy of traction, or what we can call love energy. So energy has these two, two dimensions, forward, within, and without. And by that he means um, pulling us together and pulling us forward. And so love and consciousness, in his view, become, in a sense, two dimensions of the evolution of life. And so he puts this within the framework of cosmic evolution. And he says, here we are, at, in a sense, not as the center, as the medievals would say, but as the arrow of evolution. We are now evolution conscious of itself. It does make a difference how we reflect on this process, the choices we make for this process, um, in terms of where we're going in this process. So um, religious people, I find, tend to dwell on the past. We're, we're a lot about tradition, but tradition seems to be a lot about yesterday. Teilhard, in a sense distinguishes himself as a religious person who looks to the future. That the foundation of things is not so much um, a ground of being sustaining it from beneath, as uh, a classic notion of God would support. Rather, it's a power of attraction toward what, what lies up ahead. So he will speak of God as the power of the future. Um, and that future I take not simply as a chronology of time, but the future, in a sense, as the realm of infinite possibilities. And so he says at one point, the universe organically rests on the future as its sole support. He did recognize that we are, in a sense, in a quandary in our own period of time. He's writing in the mid-20th century, where he's looking at an expanding population, where we recognize today our population around 6.9 billion in about 30 more years will be about 10 and a half billion people. And he says, we, we cannot keep, you know, this kind of evolution of conquer and divide. Um, we have limited resources, and um, we're depleting our resources this way. Uh, so in his, in his view, we must unify or annihilate. Because he asked at one point, are we a species doomed to extinction? Or are we in a moment of tension, in a sense, conflict that reads as a catalyst for evolution toward more being. And of course, that will be his position. He says in um, one of his writings, and I think it's The Future of Man, he says, the success of our evolution, of humanity's evolution, will not be determined by survival of the fittest, but by our own capacity to converge and unify. And here's where I do find um, technologists really, really on board with the evolutionary trend. In other words, um, where we are going in evolution. Taylor uh, discovered uh, computer, uh, the computer around 1950, and he was completely fascinated by this new invention and, in a sense, what it could do for us. And he said, the evolution of humanity is now a new phase of life um, in the universe toward unification of mind. And I, I want to just emphasize that, because when we talk about nanotechnology and um, uh, this kind of geoethics, I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a new level of mind, and that would be completely consonant with Teilhard's thinking, because he saw this can move us to a whole new level of cosmic evolution and therefore greater unity. Again, he saw that before the human um, emerged, it was natural selection, now it's invention that must grasp the reins. And here I find 
quite honestly, I find religions, all world religions, really, uh, really old and, and behind the curve. In other words, they're all grappling uh, and fighting over <laughs> principles that are no longer compatible with the world as we know it. And Teilhard realized that. And he said, we must, in a sense, begin to grasp the reins of invention if we are to move forward. So I love, you know, his discovery of the computer and his insight. He says we should consider interthinking humanity as a new type of organism, a new type of organism whose destiny it is to realize new possibilities for evolving life on this planet. In other words, Teilhard envisions that we humans are not, will not just stay the same as we evolve, that something is in a sense taking place through, through our own creative powers. And he speaks about moving from self-reflection to co-reflection. In other words, it's not just each one of us, you know, reflecting on where we're going. Now we reflect together, and I see this form, you know, this conference um, in Second Life as very reflective, I might say, of Teilhard's co-reflective um, idea. So, uh, to put this into his scheme, he sees that we are moving, you know, over the course of deep time, from cosmogenesis to biogenesis, and he says now with the computer, and he did envision the internet sort of as the um, a new form of global mind. He called this the, the phase of new genesis or the level of shared consciousness or the level of mind. That um, the new genesis, in a sense, emerges out of biogenesis. Uh, it is linked with the biosphere, but it also marks the end of diversification and the beginning of unification. So he sees at the, on the level of new genesis that we are in a new stage of evolution, and that's quite exciting. Uh, what Taylor envisions is that uh, as we, in a sense, um, merge, and I don't think he envisioned a, a, merge, an, a merging together a biology machine as we now experience in our own cyborgian age, but he did see the convergence of human and machine as completing the material and cerebral spheres of collective thought. So, in, in all honesty, I think he would have been quite in tune with um, the Terrorism Movement and this project of uh, geoethics and nanotechnology, because that's what he envisioned in, in the late 1940s, early 50s. He saw that evolution is not a disruption in the organic whole, but this greater unification in and through us. And so, he um, he speaks of the new emergent human as the ultra-human. And he says, uh, we're not just looking to perfect what we are, but rather we are seeking more being and more consciousness. And I like what he has to say about technology, because I do think we need something of a techno-ethics to guide um, our development you know, with technology into the future. And what uh, Teilhard says is, materialism can bring about well-being. But he says spirituality in an increase in psychic energy or consciousness brings about more being. And I think that's what we're seeking here, not just well-being or self-preservation, but a type of co-reflection towards a deepening of, of um, our being together up ahead. So that's, I, I would just highlight here the, the um, red highlighted piece. It is not well-being, but a hunger for more being, he says, which alone can preserve the thinking earth from the tedium of life. And so convergence through technology, in Tara's view, is to move us toward more being and therefore the vitality of life. So he does look at this, mer you know, this um, co-reflective process, this cyborgization, so to speak, uh, although he doesn't use that term. Teilhard sees that with the internet, with computer, with technology, we can move towards what he calls a planetization. So I might add here that he invented language to, in a sense, raise to consciousness the new reality we find ourselves in. And um, again, if I can just reemphasize here that he sees that as, as humanity evolves, that we are, with technology, now building a brain. And he, he says that he uses this language in a 1948 essay um, on the formation of the newtosphere. And he says, humanity is building its composite brain beneath our eyes. 
Um, may it not be, he says, that tomorrow, through the logical and biological deepening of the movement, drawing it together, it will find its heart, without which the ultimate wholeness of its powers of unification can never be fully achieved. And I want to, uh, I want to highlight those words, because for Teilhard, it's not just having, like, smarter people or we can do things faster. For him, it is about coming together more unified, um, sharing, in other words, our hopes for the earth together, uh, resolving, you might say, or working on the solutions to the earth together. And that means a cosmic family that is co-reflecting and co-creating. But what he does realize is that we must develop a heart together. And so he says at one point, if technology does not ultimately deepen love, then we must question the technology. You know, um, does this technology deepen us uh, as, uh, as personal in love? In other words, does it deepen what we are uh, beyond our religions, beyond our individual personhood? Does it unite us into something more whole? what he will call, again, ultra-humanity. And therefore, I think this line sort of, in my view, sums up both the technology of nanotechnology and Teilhard's vision of the ultra-human up ahead. This, this idea of cosmic personalization, which he sees is what evolution is about, that there is one rising up. As he says, it is not something in evolution, it is someone in evolution. And so he speaks of the whole process as the rise of the cosmic person. And here he will say that individual religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam, um, these are too tribal, and he says they are too tied to individual lines of escape. And he says if religion is to have power, is to move us, then each of these religions must let go of their individual lines of escape and converge in this cosmic personalization. He says that it's not a matter of heaven and earth, it's a matter of um, earth and forward movement. Um, that what we are about is a religion of the earth that will unify us, uh, that will bind us together into a greater whole. And so I think he would be fully in tune with um, the new directions in nanotechnology. I think he would be uh, quite uh, interested in the developments of technology as we move, you might say, from portable to wearables to implantables. I think he would want to uh, question, you know, what are we becoming with our technologies? He would want to have some, maybe some norm normative values, and I think that's, that's really important for us to discuss what are the normative values that we see together as we move forward with technology into uh, into a new future. What do we hope for? I think we have to speak about cosmic hope, not just personal hope. Uh, I think we have to talk about planetized hope. And so um, maybe the term that Teilhard would use is um, uh, as we develop with technologies, we're into a new realm of hyperconnectivity. And uh, Teilhard's new sphere is the realm of hyperconnectivity. But he sees that hyperconnectivity as the rise of the cosmic person. And so I think I will, uh, I will end here and then open it up for discussion. And uh, it's great to be here with you. Thank you, Ilya. Just make certain to open your chat box, which if you click on the lower left side of your screen on the bottom, you click on chat, it will open it up and it will stay up. Uh, Lori, if you can read the questions, I'd be grateful. Absolutely. No problem. My pleasure. First question is, of Teilhard's evolutionary insights, which Sorry. stands out most to you or most influences your work? Of his insights, more and more, quite honestly, I am um, intrigued by his insights on technology and the new sphere uh, because he had tremendous vision, I think, for the future of, um, of humankind. In other words, what we're becoming. 
<clears throat> and I'm, I'm really drawn by his idea of cosmic personalization. I would agree with Teilhard that our religions as they are, are based on old Greek metaphysics, on old Greek philosophical principles, and they no longer really work. Religion is not the problem. Um, religion is at the heart. Teilhard did not see religion as institution. He saw religion as the core energy of evolution itself, quite honestly. And I think today what is missing from um, this cosmic personalizing process is religion, because religions still tend to be in conflict, and therefore they are not harnessing their powers um, towards a, a, a movement towards new consciousness. So I guess to answer your question, I would I would stick with technology in the new sphere as my most re recent attractions to Teilhard. Um, what do you think Teilhard would make a proposal that we upload consciousness to online avatars? You know, I think Teilhard, he was a very novel thinker, and he would certainly be open to this possible. I think he'd be open. Now, I don't want to speak for Teilhard, because I don't want to take him out of his time period. He is a French, <laughs> French Jesuit, you know, and a 20th century person. Uh, but what I see in Teilhard is he was always open to new ideas, and that is one aspect of his life that really draws me to him. I think he would like to see what this uploading of consciousness to online avatars uh, could mean for us. Could that be part of this cosmic personalizing process? And I think if it could be, I think he would certainly be open to the possibility of it. Other questions? Yes, the next is a little off topic. We see certain occupations that conflict, like priest and lawyer. How common is the pairing of priest and scientist? How common is priest and scientist? Um, they're more common among Jesuits <laughs> than any, any other order that I know. Uh, I can think of at least two, two, three Jesuit scientists within the last um, 30 years. Two of them are still writing, and that's Brother Guy Casamagnano and uh, Father Paul Mueller, uh, both who are associated with the Vatican Observatory. Uh, Father Bill Steger, who died in March, was also a physicist. And so the Jesuits seem to, to do well on producing Jesuit scientists. But on the whole, it's, it's not all that common um, to find scientists and religious people together. Other questions or comments? You don't have to just ask questions. I'd like to hear some comments. The next question is, so the Jesuits appear to be more progressive? Yes, definitely. Um, they're, they're very, so here let me back up with the Jesuits. They Their founder, Ignatius of Loyola, uh, had a deep spirituality uh, of the Incarnation. In other words, a deep belief that God became human. So when we say that, when we say God becomes human, we're saying that materiality is imbued with divinity. In other words, God has entered into the material world or to the created world. And that is at the fundamental heart of um, Jesuit spirituality. So they will speak of Christ in all things. And that that spiritual insight has propelled their intellectual endeavors. In other words, it's, it's what fuels their intellectual pursuits. And I think that's why we do find um, this, this uh, combination of science and religion among many of them. Anyone else? How about the rise of the cosmic person? I mean, how does that, you know, how does that idea sit with others? Uh, are there any insights on cosmic personalization? Or even Teilhard's um, idea that the Christ is not limited to Jesus, but 
the Christ is the whole of cosmic evolution. I, I'm not sure if I emphasize that, but that is exactly what he's saying. Ilya, Michael yes, Denon yes. asks. Michael Denon asks. I really like the idea of a focus on okay. love as a guiding principle. Would you please mm -hmm. comment a bit more on this? Yes. Um. So again, Teilhard sees there's an energy of attraction at the heart of cosmic life. Um, and as he explores that energy of attraction, he says this energy of attraction is not a random attraction. It's a center to center, what he calls a center to center attraction. And he's, he says love is the most personal, the most centered of all forces of attraction. And so he speaks of this love energy at the heart of cosmic and biological life. So he says, even the most fundamental molecules of life, even quarks, in Tara's view, have love energy. Um, there is, in a sense, this, this centration within them that opens them up to, to uh, force other forces of attraction. So he's saying that love is not an emotion, certainly. It's not a sentiment. Love is an energy of attraction, and that this love energy, this attractive force of love, is, in a sense, what accounts for, you might say, convergent evolution. There is this energy of attraction throughout cosmic and biological evolution. So why is this important? Because all religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam, they are all based on, a, on some type of metaphysics, or the principles that are you might say, underlying physics or the principles that support reality. And what Tarot is basically saying is that the principles that support reality are love. It, it, the principle is love, love energy. And so that makes, I think, you know, certainly from a religious perspective, certainly a more positive spin on reality itself, that what we are about is a type of energy that is unitive, that draws together a type of energy that is creative and that is generative of life itself. So Teilhard is saying that, and this again goes back to his idea that he dismissed original sin. He rejected it. It's not that he rejects sin, but he sees sin as part and parcel as an unfinished universe. In other words, that things do, you know, fall apart, they decay. Um, yes, we do have free will. Uh, we, do we can choose against the good. That is also sin. But sin is not the reason for the rise of Christ. Um, in Teilhard's view, the reason for Christification of the universe is love, because there's a power of love at the heart of this universe that is not just love energy, but that is love itself, and that will be um, God. And so, you know, God is love. Love is not something God does. Love is what God is. This love is at the heart of this this physical universe, and therefore it's this love energy that is seeking to rise up in the most personal um, type of relationship, uh, what he calls, again, cosmic personalization. So he thinks large, he doesn't think small, he thinks future, he doesn't think only present, and love is the name of the game. Michael Denon comments <laughs> and asks... <laughs> I also appreciate the concept of the cosmic person. One thing I'm looking for is a good modern language for souls, that aspect of humans that is the direct connection to a larger reality. This seems to be, this seems to connect to the cosmic person concept. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes. No, it's a very good question. Um, you know, interestingly, at least from my perspective, and Charles Henderson might, might um, pop in here, I do not see much language of soul in Teilhard. A lot of language of spirit, but not a, language, a lot of language of soul. However, I agree that there is an important role for soul. And I see soul maybe um, as the core constituent relationality of anything and anyone that exists. So that while we are um, each part and parcel of cosmic person, we are, in a sense, each particular um, constituent relational parts of the cosmic whole. Maybe the idea of holons is helpful here. 
that each person or each element is a whole and part of a larger whole, that each element has its own constituent relationality, um, but that core constituent relationality is not separate from something larger than itself, but it indeed um, uh, has its own personality precisely because it is part of something more than itself, if I can put it in that respect. In other words, there's a core constituent relationship to everything that exists, but everything that exists, exists precisely in relation to something more than itself and other than itself. And it's precisely by that relationship to something other than itself that it really is itself. <laughs> I know it sounds like a lot of words, but it's an idea that Teilhard had, that there is core constituent being, but that it's union that differentiates. It's only because we are part of something so much more than ourselves that we are ourselves. It goes back to his idea of interbeing, or rather that relationality is, in a sense, the very source and life of being itself. So love and soul do have, um, do have resonance in this thought, but I think more work is done on what soul is for Teilhard. What do you envision that a Teilhard-inspired set of techno-ethics may include? Um, I think he, he sort of lays out some techno-ethics for us in his writings on the Newton sphere and the future of man. And um, I would include in those techno-ethics uh, a sense of um, more being and more consciousness. In other words, do we have a deepened sense of self and otherness <coughs> or not? I find today, if I can just put this in a different perspective, a lot of people have use, use our devices and our technologies for information, but without having a sense of what, where we're going with the information, we run into information overload and brain fatigue. <laughs> and I think we have, at the end of the day, a lot of couch potatoes. Uh, and therefore, Teilhard asks, you know, does this technology, I think we can ask ourselves, does it deepen love for us? Does it deepen our consciousness? In other words, do we have a greater awareness of being part of something more than ourselves? And do we feel connected to that larger whole? Do we have a greater sense of compassion? You know, do we have a greater sense of sympathy or something binding us beyond ourselves to something more whole than ourselves? And maybe the word is community. I mean, that could be a good word here. Does, does the technosphere, does the techno person have a greater sense of being, um, of belonging? And maybe that's the question. So I think a techno ethics has to have the values of life, consciousness, community, sympathy, compassion, um, and building something together for the future. Uh, and I'm not sure we, we're there yet. I think we are, uh, we could be on the cusp of that new consciousness of <coughs> uh, the cosmic person. But we need something more explicit in terms of techno ethics and in terms of raising to consciousness what we are doing together in building a new world together through technology. Others? Or other questions or comments? <clears throat> I realized there was a yes, go ahead. Is there someone else? No, I don't see any other see questions any other. Or at this time. Okay. Sister Ilya extremely much for the um, keynote presentation today and and in a manner some new ways of looking at things or working with other other people toward a, a collective goal Oops. okay this brings us to our next speaker speaker Michael Shermer, PhD, editor-in-chief of Skeptic Magazine and monthly columnist at, uh, with Scientific American. The topic of his presentation is Singularity Skepticism, Cautious Optimism, and a Protopian Approach.
Michael, you may now approach the podium. Michael, to speak, you need to press the speak button on the lower left side of your, yep. uh, the bottom of your screen. Okay. Okay. How's that? Now you should be able to hear me. Perfect. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm speaking today on, um, uh, well, moral progress, the, the long-term uh, future of humanity based on what's been going on, which is sort of like what TLR de Chardin was attempting to do, although uh, his was, I think, less science-based than than a lot of scientists would would have liked, but um, but the idea of the of transhumanism and the singularity and and uh, the future of humanity based on science and technology that's all good stuff. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so should I start? Yes, uh, please. Okay, so um, so my talk is based on my latest book, The Moral Arc. the The title, of course, comes from. Uh, Dr. King's famous uh, speech that he gave at the climax of his uh, march from Selma to Montgomery, in which he asked rhetorically how long it will be before they achieve civil rights, and he said it won't be long because the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, and um, and that, that you know that's kind of a metaphor for I think the long term <clears throat> long term progress. We know, for example, that a couple months after he gave that speech, that President Johnson, seen there. Uh, signed into law the uh, Voting Rights Act, Dr. King overlooking his shoulder there. And uh, <clears throat> that gave, uh, uh, you know, everyone not, not just the right to vote, but but the actual practice of voting. Um, and that, you know, that, of course, followed on the, the heels of the uh, women's right to vote, uh, which came to America in 1920, fairly late in the game. But um, uh, but still, nevertheless, we were about right in the middle of, of democracies granting women the right to vote. Um, this is a woman named uh, Inez Milholland who uh, led a march on Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1913 on that white stallion there. Uh, sometimes it takes, you know, a spectacular um, type of, um, of protest to get people's attention to the needs of, of, uh, of a group that's been uh, oppressed. And, and, and we're right now in the middle of a, another rights revolution, you know, same-sex marriage and, and gay rights. Um, and the fact that uh, the Supreme Court voted in June uh, was a huge step. I predicted that would happen in uh, 2015. My book came out in January of 2015. I wrote I wrote that chapter about a year before, and it looked like 2015 would be about the time that um, same-sex marriage would be legalized. And uh, and it's a good model of how uh, moral revolutions come about. That is to say, uh, the same-sex marriage. Revolution was mostly led by secularists and uh, people that believed in civil rights and civil liberties, and it was mostly opposed by religious people whose goal it is generally to conserve uh, the status quo and not bring about too much change. Uh, but that's that's pretty fairly common. T typically, moral revolutions are resisted by religions and led by secularists and young people, I should add, too. The uh, the right for gays to vote was uh, primarily supported by millennials, people born after 1981, mostly opposed by older people. So being religious and older was a predictor for resisting uh, that particular revolution. But nevertheless, it happened as as these things go. And uh, and so now that the law has changed, the law has to be enforced, which it will be. And then within probably five to ten years, no one will, actually probably by 2016 or 2017, no one will even be talking about it anymore. 
just like no one talks about interracial marriage anymore. That used to be a thing. It was illegal in 1967 for blacks and whites to marry in America. Now it's, you know, it's it's not in a it's not even a topic of discussion. And that that's the way it'll be for um, uh, for same sex marriage and gay rights. Um, and by the way, I have some good news for those of you who are in favor of both gay marriage and pot legalization. Because it says in Levit Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man lies with another man, he must be stoned. <laughs> so you can use that if you want on your conservative friends. Uh, but that is the, the long-term uh, arc, is to grant more people autonomy over their bodies and their minds, their decisions, their choices are theirs. Um, so I track in my book, this is, is, consider this kind of a social singularity, our moral singularity. Uh, the abolition of slavery, uh, the abolition of uh, torture, ju judicial torture, seen here, torturing a, a witch. Um, and uh, here's some of the instruments of torture. This is the famous rack. Uh, and, uh, and all this was eventually overturned by the idea of, of uh, justice. Um, that is a judicial system in which, um, as seen in the famous statue of, ju uh, of Judicia, of, um, of being blind to bias, having a scale for a, a balanced um, uh, a trial, and then the sword for enforcing the law. Uh, so the death penalty will probably be one of the next uh, moral revolutions in America. That is, we're the last of the... Uh, say, top 20 industrialized democracies in the world to um, uh, have the death penalty. 31 states, 31 of the 50 states still have uh, the death penalty on the books as legal, but only a few actually practice it. If you took out Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, and Ohio, there'd be almost no executions in the United States. Almost all death row inmates die of old age. Uh, so the death penalty is on death row. I'm predicting there'll be dead by 2025 to 2030, sort of coordinating with Ray Kurzweil's singularity date. Uh, animal rights is also a, a future. It's happening now, but it's it's uh, uh, it, it's part of our future moral revolutions, led initially by Jeremy Bentham, the great utilitarian philosopher who said the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So part of the moral arc has been bending because of our sensitivities to the suffering of other sentient beings. Uh, and I use the, the, the phrase sentient beings rather than humans so that we can expand our moral consciousness to include other animals. After all, we are an animal. Um, how far is the moral arc bent? I claim everyone today, conservatives included, are more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s. Here's a few uh, images of that, say black and white restrooms and, and, uh, and certain groups not served in restaurants. Uh, here's uh, you know, it, uh, racially segregated uh, cab services and stores and restaurants, um, whites only, uh, whites only military police, uh, black military police. Again, these kinds of signs you see, uh, or a, a good public display of a um, of an execution. We don't do that anymore. Uh, a nuclear uh, bomb being exploded in the desert of Nevada. The family, a mother and son, watching. Um, you know the uh, the idea of you know the KKK visiting a um, fair fairgrounds. Um, you know lynchings are are not uh, ended essentially in 1950s. No more lynchings. Um, but what about ISIS and violent religion? They they certainly uh, practice these kind of barbaric. Uh, acts, immoral acts, but in fact ISIS, there's nothing new about what ISIS did. This is what Christians used to do to Jews and others, uh, people they thought were witches or uh, Christ killers, uh, which, which the Jews were accused of being. This is from a 12th century French illuminated Bible in which two Christian soldiers are about to behead um, two Jews. And, uh, you know, that that's that's the kind of thing that religions used to do that they don't do anymore. And, and the reason is not because they made some biblical discovery or reinterpretation or they got a new revelation from God. It's that uh, they become uh, more moral because of secular society moving in a more moral direction. Um, and uh, so we no longer see witch burnings. And again, it's not that there was some discovery made in religion that there aren't witches. It's that science showed us that witchcraft is, 
fact, you know, not real. And I call this the witch theory of causality. That is, if you believe that women cavorting with demons cause um, disease and, and plagues and accidents and disasters, then, then you're either insane or you lived 500 years ago when everybody believed this. And uh, so what happened is, is that we changed that. As Voltaire said, uh, uh, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Well, the belief that witches are real and cause uh, diseases and accidents and plagues, that's absurd. And then the atrocity comes from, you know, killing people that you believe are witches. So uh, essentially that's what we've done. Science and reason have replaced superstition and these dogmas of believing these crazy things about people. Um, so correcting mistaken beliefs about other people is the first step in expanding the moral sphere. And that comes about from what I call enlightenment humanism, that is using science and reason uh, to try to solve moral problems. And instead of moralizing about evil, use science and reason to solve social problems. And that began with the scientific revolution and the discovery by people like Copernicus and Kepler and seeing here Galileo and Newton that the universe is understandable. It's governed by laws and principles that we can know and understand and then apply to make the world a better place. And ever since. Uh, then, Enlightenment philosophers, people like uh, seen here, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, uh, John Locke, and, and Thomas Hobbes before them, Adam Smith, David Hume, Immanuel Kant. These were all Enlightenment philosophers who were not especially religious, but who attempted, like their scientific revolutionaries before them, to apply the methods of science to solving social and moral problems. And that's been the primary driving force uh, behind the moral more progress, as I've documented in the in the moral arc. Uh, now, as for the future, let's talk about that. That's the final chapter of my book. <clears throat> it's called Protopia, um, and, and it has to do with with making some uh, predictions about the future. And as Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, that's a dangerous enterprise indeed, uh, given that in the long run and possibly in the short run, uh, the most daring uh, prophecies turn out to be laughably conservative. Still, um, a man's uh, reach should should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? So, um, you know, I do make some ideas here, and I like the the idea of Protopia. Kevin Kelly is the uh, co-founder of Wired magazine, and he's now the one of the internet gurus at Google. And uh, <clears throat> Kevin's idea is like, forget utopia. Let's just go for Protopia. That is just small increments of progress day by day, making the world slightly better tomorrow than it is today slightly better today than it was yesterday, and so on. Uh, in other words, instead of uh, asking, where's my flying car, uh, and, and, and making the transition from 1950s jalopies to flying cars, let's just go for slightly smarter cars today than yesterday, uh, slightly safer cars tomorrow than today, and, and so on. Just increments of progress. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, in terms of politics, uh, you know, looking at uh, the, the you know the long term future of of uh, nation states and and so on, um, we see a, a transition in polities from you know hundreds and hundreds that used to dominate Europe to just you know a few dozen, um, and uh, this is the you know the, the long term progress toward one world government. I don't know, uh, probably not, mainly because uh, fixing the pothole problem that is. You know, probably governance is moving toward more local, like it used to be centuries ago, <clears throat> instead of just one giant government, but but run smartly using computers and so on. So maybe centuries hence, there uh, there won't be you know one world government or or 186 or 191, however many countries it is right now that changes constantly. Uh, just have lots and lots of um, city states. That is, the mayors will be the future of of politics. Um, instead of dear leaders and presidents and dictators and prime ministers, maybe the mayor, uh, that is city-states will be where the action is. After all, nations change constantly over the last several thousand years, uh, but cities have, have remained have been kind of the primary force of stability. Um, I recommend this book, If Mayors Rule the World, uh, is, a, is a good way to think about um, how problems actually get solved on a local basis. You know, nations don't really do that. Uh, cities do that. Mayors do that, not presidents. Um, as uh, Mayor uh, Theorioli LaGuardia said, there's no democratic or republican way of fixing a sewer. That's right. It just has to get done. Um, and so if you look at the long-term uh, trends toward um, 
uh, where populations live, people are moving more towards cities and urban areas rather than uh, in, um, uh, in, in in rural areas. That's the trend. And so by 2050 or so, the you know vast majority of the population will live in cities. So cities are where the action is going to be. And so I'm predicting, you know, as as these tiny communities over the past several centuries coalesced into larger and larger states, instead of ending up at one world government, we'll end up bounce off the floor and end up at lots and lots of small polities again, city states run by um, uh, run by mayors and, and the people. The end of power is another book I recommend. That is, um, sources of power are moving away from giant. Uh, governments and corporations toward um, smaller groups and, and individuals. Um, you can see that in, in how uh, who wins wars now more and more smaller polities are are winning uh, wars over in conflicts over larger polities. Uh, it's just the way it, it happens to work. Bombing like this of small countries like Vietnam did not go over well in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, popularity of the leaders. Uh, the declining power of big corporations, um, uh, you know, the number of companies still on the Fortune 500 list from 50 years ago has changed dramatically. The length of time that CEOs stay in power, the, length, the, the number of years or decades that a company can dominate a particular industry has been going down. Uh, so it's harder and harder for, for, for corporations and governments to, to maintain power. And then I also recommend um, uh, along these lines these uh, older books that prophesized about this, these kinds of shifts, Citadel Market, uh, Market and Altar and the Art of Community, that is, proprietary communities may be part of the future. Uh, we already see this with uh, malls, shopping shopping centers or proprietary communities, ours as our condominium complexes and uh, retirement communities like these and um, industrial parks. Parks, privately owned, private roads, private colleges and universities, and uh, you know corporate campuses uh, in our proprietary communities, and, uh, hotels are pri proprietary communities. Hotels corridors are like private streets, and elevators and escalators are like private transportation systems. The center of the hotel and the stores and restaurants and complexes like that. Hotel transportation systems. Um, and so there's a balance there, I think, between, you know, the public and the private, nicely described by Robert Nozick in his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, that I recommend. And then finally, let's look at protopian economics. That is, uh, will we one day get, reach the point, what's called Star Trek economics, that is post-scarcity uh, scarcity, uh, economics, where everybody has so much money uh, and so wealthy that all, all you need is a replicator, something like a 3D printer and you just order your you know earl gray tea hot tea earl gray hot <laughs> uh and uh, you can see here just the, the the you know the increase in prosperity from right now about sixty six hundred dollars per person per cap uh, per capita gdp per person throughout the world to doubling that in just a few decades and that the majority of the people at the end of the 21st century will have far more wealth uh, well more than double that of, of the 20th century, and, and that will just continue. Uh, what about poverty? Of course, that's still a problem, but uh, we're now predicting uh, that the end of poverty uh, around 2030 or so, that as the UN defines poverty as making less than $1.25 a day, uh, that that will be gone pretty soon. That doesn't mean if you make $2.50 a day, which is mild poverty, you're rich. No, of course not, but uh, getting more people to um, have more of the basics of life is Again, moral progress. So from civilization 1.0, where we began in the trees and began living in small communities, bands and tribes, coalesced in the chieftains and states and empires, and then by civilization 2.0, we, we may be in this world of smaller polities. And uh, so uh, I'll end this little talk here and take some questions, um, you know, where I end my book uh, with reflecting on Dr. King's observations that each of us is two selves and, you know, when that uh, the evil self tries to emerge, but the better self, you know, um, uh, triumph over that, and uh, that um, that we are in fact. Uh, he well, he 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 speculated about being, um, you know, being born for eternity and made for the stars, but but as I say, in fact, we're made from the stars, and uh, 
and that uh, you know that that that's the future of of uh, moral progress is that we are in fact morality is something that carbon atoms can embody given a billion years of evolution. Uh, and so my book is a secular scientific based argument from moral progress. Um, and uh, so with that, I thank you and we'll take questions. Okay. What would you like me to do now? Do you have your chat bot open? Chat oh, box? chat bot. Uh, let's see. Uh, no. Forget where that is. Um, the left side of your screen, it says chat. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there we go. Okay, got it. All right, here we go. Uh, what do you think, Teilhard? would make of the proposal that we upload consciousness to online avatars. <laughs> well, I, I doubt it. he would have even thought of something like that since uh, virtual realities were, were not uh, real or virtual in, in his own time. But that is the idea that I guess the new sphere is where, you know, we all exist in this, um, this kind of spiritual space. Um, again, I, I have to say, I think um, that the idea of, of the singularitarians, you know, that we're going to, you know, soon by 2030, 2040 achieve, um, you know, integration with computers and, and therefore you can live forever digitally or whatever. Um, I, I'd rather that that people work on solving immediate, more immediate problems, you know, again, like the fixing the pothole problem. <clears throat> I'm not worried about living forever. I just want to make it, say, the next 10 years without getting cancer or maybe the next 20 years without getting Alzheimer's or senility. Uh, or, or Parkinson's. I mean, can you solve problems like that? And the answer is no. We haven't solved those problems. So before we start thinking about, hey, we're going to get to live forever if you make it to 2030 or 2040, how about just make it to 2020 without getting cancer? Can we do that? And uh, uh, so that, you know, I think that that's the sort of thing I'd rather think about um, in, in terms of uh, the future of our consciousness. Um, how about just in, in my own body, in my own brain, rather than uploading it to a computer? I think we're a long ways from that. I don't think it's 2030 or 2040. I think 2130, 2140, or in the year 2525, I think that's a more realistic goal uh, for when that's going to be. I think the problem is much harder. We don't even know what consciousness is yet. We don't even know how to explain consciousness based on, you know, neurals, uh, neural networks and, and neural interconnections and neural, uh, various neural theories, uh, we don't, we don't understand. So <clears throat> I, I think, uh, I think we have a long ways to go. Let's see, somebody asks, I appreciate that you have emphasized how integral spirit and body are in Jesuit practice and theology. Okay, I think that's probably not for me. Uh, but um, I, I will say that I think to the extent that religions, like Teilhard's religious beliefs seem to predict, you know, the new sphere seem to predict the internet. Something. I think that's just mostly coincidental, just picking out in hindsight which religious or spiritual leaders seem to get it right. Um, I, I, most of them did not get it right. <laughs> uh, most predictions turn out to be wrong, and in hindsight we pick out the ones that turn out to be right and elevate those people as prophetic, but, but uh, you know, turning from the present toward the future, you know, it's good to record those predictions now and see how well any one particular prophet does. Um, so, you know. Okay, here's another one. With regard to the moral arc, how far away do you believe we are? Uh, wait, there go. Hang on. I lost the question. Uh, uh, are from delivering human-like rights to, say, the great apes, dolphins? Okay, so... Uh, the first step in animal rights is, is to just avoid um, suffering, torturing them, making them live miserable lives. Uh, so the Humane Society, for example, and other organizations to protect the rights of animals, all, all they were trying to do really is to prevent them from suffering. And that's, that's a good start. That's how it begins. Uh, obviously, we don't need to grant chimpanzees and dolphins the right to vote. We're not talking about that. <clears throat> we're mostly talking about the right for them to lead autonomous, free lives to fulfill their evolutionary biological destinies, to, you know, live out, survive, and flourish, and mate, and 
make families and children, whatever that particular species does by its nature, that's what they should be free to do. So that's all we're talking about in terms of animal rights uh, is the right for them not to suffer and to and not just not to suffer, but also to lead a relatively fulfilling life based on their evolved uh, destiny, their their nature. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that would be the first step uh, that we, we've been already moving toward. I think we're a ways from that in terms of you know, hunting, meat eating, you know, the trends are in the right direction, but they're still pretty small. The number of percentage of people that are vegetarians or vegans is, is pretty small. Uh, still, still in single digits in most countries. Uh, but still, you know, in the long term, we're talking about the long term future. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, the replacement of meat, for example, by synthetic meat, you know, once that is accomplished, that would be a big step. But uh, we're a ways from that. So. Any other questions? What was your inspiration to writing the moral arc? Well, first was um, just sort of a expansion from my previous books, which deal with you know mo mostly with science, pseudoscience, science and religion, science and morality. So <clears throat> expanding on that, you know, where are we going? What's the the future of 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 morality and religion and spirituality and that sort of thing from a scientific perspective? More specifically, um, my friend Steven Pinker in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, or Sam Harris, The Moral Landscape, or Matt Ridley's The Rational Optimist. You know, these are friends of mine, fellow authors, science authors, who write about these kinds of subjects, uh, and we all build on each other's work. And uh, so building on my own work, on their work, uh, just kind of pushing the frontiers, how far can we go with this idea that there is such a thing as moral progress? Uh, is it true? And if it's true, then where's it going? And uh, if religion is not the major driving force behind moral progress, what is? And, uh, you know, so that's that's the basis of, of the, the book. Will you be collaborating with those fellow science writers on a project or book? <laughs> uh, probably not a book. You know, we all kind of just do our own thing, write our own books. But, you know, maybe in uh, future uh, interviews and, and uh, television series and films. And, you know, that's sort of the next set of projects that I'm working on is doing uh, getting these uh, the word out by um, doing uh, more visual, audiovisual, film, television, even virtual reality. Uh, uh, programs like this, which is kind of interesting, a new way of communicating. So yeah, that's the idea. Any other questions? Are you working on another book? Yes, the next book is uh, called Heavens on Earth. I uh, just signed a contract for it, so uh, and I'm in, just in the research stage now. But it's about um, different versions of heaven and hell. <laughs> First, religious or you know pre-religious or whatever the idea of our awareness of our own death, and uh, and then attempts to uh, overcome that <clears throat> or find immortality somehow. So I go through all the re I'll go through all the religious versions of that, including especially of course the Christian idea of heaven and hell, but then more secular versions. Um, that is to say, <clears throat> the stuff we're talking about here, the new sphere, or the singularity or whatever, that we get to live forever, you know, in a virtual reality, say, for example, that would be uh, a kind of a heaven. Or more political versions like utopias, you know, can we design a perfect society in which everyone's happy forever? The answer is no. <laughs> and uh, so in a way, this book is expanding from where I left off in the moral arc. Uh, that is this you know attempt to create this perfect world uh, it 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 can't work because people are too diverse so that's to be multiple uh peaks on the moral landscape as sam harris likes to say you know multiple different kinds of societies and political entities and social institutions and so on so much variety there's no one perfect way to live uh but the you know these attempts to live forever you know they're deep in our in our human psychology um but the fact is, uh, there's 7 billion people living today, about 100 billion people lived before us. Uh, not one person has ever achieved immortality that we know of or gone to heaven and come back to tell us about it. Uh, no evidence for any of that. So as far as we know, this is it. Uh, so rather than, uh, you know, 
just speculating about how great it's going to be in the future, don't miss out on how great it is now because this we know for sure exists and we don't know if there's such a thing as, as heaven. So that's my next book that I'm now working on. What are your thoughts on living forever through something like a mind file and attempt to digitize one's consciousness? My thoughts are I'm skeptical, very skeptical. I don't think we're uh, anywhere close to being able to do anything like that. Uh, and and uh, again, we don't even know how uh, consciousness arises from the brain. Obviously it does, but we don't know how it does. So before you can create something like that in a computer, you have to first understand how it happens in the electric meat of our brain, and we don't. So I think we're a ways from that. Uh, it's possible it could be something like a human genome project, which was accomplished in uh, far shorter time than anyone predicted. I mean, people were saying, you know, a century, you know, it took a decade, so, you know, 10 times faster. But but the human genome, I mean, you know, we're just talking about four base pairs here. Uh, this is this is nothing even remotely as complex as the human brain. You know, you're talking about 100 billion neurons, you know, 1,000 billion or a trillion uh, synaptic inter interconnections, maybe more than how all those those interact with each other, you know, compounds the complexity by many, many, many orders of magnitude more than the human genome. So the idea that, that the human genome project is a model for you know, how we're going to achieve digital consciousness, um, it, it doesn't really work. It's It's a much harder problem. Does anyone else have any questions for Michael? I don't see anything else, Michael. Thank you so much for that that presentation. It it, it uh, made me think in a lot of areas that I hadn't really touched much on before. <laughs> okay, well, you're welcome. And so thank I you think for we're running a few of minutes this. ahead. Uh, our next speaker, if you would like to take a seat, Michael. Okay, I will do that. Our next speaker, the title of his presentation is Theo de Chardin and Catholic, Catholic Mystical Tradition is Kevin O'Neill, Ph.D., Professor Emeritus of the University of Redlands in California. We welcome Kevin to the podium. Can everyone hear me? Um, I think this is me. But I want to introduce myself and to say that I have never been in second, as I'm sure many of you. And I want to put a few caveats. First, um, I've been checking. I disappear. Uh, the second is that my accounts have been some reason jumps from please don't think about my presentation. You might hear in the background I have no rescue dog. Of course I'm sure we might hear part of the presentation. Kevin, uh, what I'd like to do today is... Kevin, your voice is coming through a little sporadic. You may possibly wish to uh, sign off and sign back on again. You might improve your connection. Okay, sign off uh, second time entirely? Yes, and come back in. It might improve your connection. Okay, let me try that. I'll keep going. Thank you for your patience, everyone, as we try to... Um, uh, have Kevin grasp onto a stronger signal or, or have a stronger connectivity. Bear with us a few moments.
Is this clearer? Yes, it seems to be. Okay, I can start. Should I start all over again? Yes, please. Okay. Hello. First of all, I, now my sound is hearable. Thank you. Um, I wanted to issue certain caveats about this. Number one of which is that Second Life has checked me out a couple of times this morning. So if I disappear again, it's not my decision. Uh, second, you may hear a dog barking in the background. I just got a new rescue dog and we're still training him. So that again is not part of the presentation. And third, my avatar for reasons that are unknown to me has sometimes tended to jump in my other visits here. So if I jump, don't take it personal. It's not about um, the talk. Um, so I want to begin by first thanking the Terrison Foundation and Dr. Rothblatt, and especially Lori Rhodes, without whom I would never have gotten in this room. I've been wandering around the Second Life site, and she's been invaluable in helping me, as she's been helping everyone today. So I want to thank everyone involved with this. And to just note that uh, I am delighted to be on this list of very impressive and knowledgeable speakers. What I'd like to do today is twofold. Number one, I want to talk about the position of Teilhard de Chardin with respect to the Catholic Church as it stands at the moment. And second, I want to trace back his difficulties with the Church to what I consider two different models of Catholic belief and practice, which I think are also models that occur in other world religions. And I'm going to offer you some almost laughably simple templates uh, that those of you who are theologians will find almost comically uh, simple. But I think they're clear and they help us guide us through um, his ideas in a way that might be uh, pleasantly simple. So let's begin. And um, the first slide I'm going to show you is of Teilhard de Chardin's very simple grave site in uh, a place called St. Andrews on Hudson in New York. It's in Hyde Park, officially near Poughkeepsie. It used to be a Jesuit cemetery that was behind the Jesuit novitiate at St. Andrews. They have since sold that building to the Culinary Institute of America, but they've kept the graveyard. Um, I came upon this graveyard, it must have been about 1960. I had read Teilhard's Phenomenon of Man probably within hours of the, the moment when it was put into bookstores in 1959 in English, and it transformed my life. I was uh, very much a product of Jesuit education, Jesuit high school, and Jesuit college. And I was a skeptic, uh, and it was delightful to, to see a Jesuit scientist who was incorporating evolution and cosmology into his appreciation of the Catholic Church and appealed to me immensely. I also learned later that Teilhard was living across the street from my high school in the rectory of St. Ignatius of Loyola Church on 84th Street in Manhattan for the last several years of his life in exile from France where the, uh, the church would not let him assume a position at the Ecole des Etudes in uh, Paris. And the, the next slide just says that I describes that. Um, and I want to talk about Teilhard's problems with the church. Let me go two slides forward. Uh, Teilhard was forbidden to teach, as has been mentioned, more than once, not, only, not so much by the absolute hierarchy of the church, but often by his Jesuit superiors. And his written works were kept from publication, again, for a variety of reasons, for more than 20 years. He wrote probably The Phenomenon of Man in the late 1930s, early 40s. But the French edition didn't get published until 1955, and the uh, English translation until 59. So his work was not out there. Um, his rejection culminated, interestingly, and I was surprised by this too, uh, when the Holy Office under Pope John XXIII, who was the instigator of Vatican II, which we think of as the source of all things liberal and Catholicism, but he permitted the Holy Office to issue a monitum or a reprimand against Teilhard's work. This is not an accusation of heresy, by the way. He was never declared a heretic by the church, and he was never put 
on what was called the Index of Forbidden Books, which was a major part of Catholic arcana back in the 50s. I remember it well. Uh, but I do know that um, people in religious institutions, for example, the current governor of California, Jerry Brown, who was in Jesuit seminary, was forbidden to read his books, and Catholic bookstores were not permitted to sell his work. But since then, he has had a huge um, reversal of fortunes. Interestingly, as you see in the slide, he's a linchpin of the philosophy and theology of the notable doctrinal conservative Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI. So Ratzinger, who is known as the, the pit bull of the Vatican, who is very conservative, uh, embraced Teilhard, as did the prominent Catholic theologian Henri de Lubac. So relatively early on, he was accepted and integrated by many Catholic theologians, because as any Catholic knows, the church is much more complex and filled with division and controversy and debate than most non-Catholics understand. So he was very much a part of uh, Catholic theology. Um, but what I want to talk about today are the reasons why Teilhard's status in the church has been so volatile. And my hunch is it's because the Catholic Church, let's see, let me make sure I have this. No, I want, I'm not doing the slides well. Okay, let me get to the next slide. Okay. And the fact that the Catholic Church has always had two very different models to describe the relationship between humans and their creator. And my presentation today will try to articulate the two models and locate the art with respect to each. And the first model is what I call the top-down model, or model A. Again, very simple. In this, God is the source of all power, but God is, has three characteristics that are very important. He's transcendent. God is not part of the system. He's an extra systemic being um, who is outside of our realm. He's of a different order of being than we are, to the fact that we can't even assign the concept of existence to both God and humans and creation in the same way. God, secondly, is numinous, that is, is filled with mystery. Uh, there's something impenetrable about God for a human being. So, in a sense, he's transcendent and then he's numinous. He's also what Rudolf Otto, in his wonderful book, The Idea of the Holy, calls Gans Andera, or totally other than us. His transcendence and his numinous character makes him radically other. So, God and humans are separated by God's mysterious superiority. But there's a second problem in this model, too. Um, if we go back to the Catholic theology of sin, which is central to Catholic vision of human beings, not only are God and man disconnected by the difference in the way they are, they're also disconnected by the fact of human sin. And sin is essentially, if you look at Genesis carefully, a human rejection of the divine rules. When Eve, who's the first rebel, wonderfully, in uh, Catholic or, or religious history, rejects God's plan and his rule about the eating of the, the uh, fruit of the tree of, of uh, knowledge. What she's saying is, and it says it explicitly, they would be as God, says Augustine. And God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, because they attempted a coup d'etat. They forgot to eat of the tree of life, which would have given them immortality. Um, so he, he ejects them in order that they not rebel again. So humans are separated in the Catholic, in this top-down tradition, by two breaks, God's transcendence and human sin. Okay, so we have a double problem there. Now, the Catholic Church and Traditional Catholicism provides different ways to heal this double breach. Again, first, it's all coming from God. God sends his only son in the incarnation. He incarnates or enfleshes his son, who then has to suffer the crucifixion a painful death in order to redeem, and he has to get up from the dead, he has to become resurrected, in order to give, offer us redemption or 
to uh, pay the price for, for human sin. Here the idea is God has to do everything. He has to come to earth. He has to suffer, he has to die, he has to be resurrected in order to give us the kind of salvation that we cannot in any way create for ourselves. Let me catch these things up here. Okay. Oh, excuse me, I walked inadvertently. Okay, what we have here then next is the idea that the way Catholics get connected this whole uh, system of incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and redemption is through what's called the life of the sacraments. And the old Baltimore Catechism when I was a kid said, sacraments are out outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace. What the sacraments do is they connect us to the saving life of God. Uh, they save us. They let it, they enable human beings who are utterly incapable of saving themselves to be saved by the presence of God. And here's a, a traditional image of the, the Catholic crucifixion, right, uh, in which I epitomize the epicenter of traditional Catholic belief. Christ, the Son of God, was sent to earth to suffer and die for our sins. After he died, he was buried. After three days, he rose from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended to heaven. If we believe in this redemptive act and participate in this act of grace through the sacraments, we will be saved and join him in heaven when we die. That's the standard model. But, and as I say in the next slide, this model is highly dualistic. Um, let me get that slide up. Christ comes down from another world, heaven, and saves humans on earth so they can leave earth and join him somewhere else in heaven. But, there's another model, what I call Model B. Within this dominant model, there are other possibilities. In the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, there's a hint of a much closer connection when God makes the first humans, when he makes the first humans, even before that. But in Genesis 1, 26, 27, 7, the text reads, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Man and woman, he created them. And this creates a, what I want to call a secret connection between God and humans. When God creates the world, everything he creates has, by definition, to be always already part of God. And when he says that human beings especially are made in his image and likeness, what you're saying is that um, there's something divine already in humans. And I read right here, every mystic knows at the heart of his or her life is the truth that the divine secretly or not so secretly already lives in the deepest part of her heart. And I've got a quote from a commentary on St. Augustine, which I'll read because it's vital. Let us consider more closely this pole of interiority. It is in the course of his own seeking for truth, in particular under the influence of the books of Plato, that Augustine discovers that truth is not outside, but in the most intimate part of the soul. He writes in his confessions, by following the way of the flesh, I was seeking you. But you, you were more intimate than the intimacy found in myself and higher than the heights of myself. Um, that which I was reading outside, I recognized inside. One should read again the whole first part of Book 10 of the Confessions on the search for God through his different fears. Furries, outside, interest, inside, and curious, inner. The itinerary does not stop the level of contemplation with God in the most intimate part of man. The idea here is that as we see in this famous Bernini sculpture of um, St. Teresa of Avila in uh, St. Peter's in Rome, and I, let me just go to the next slide, the secret present. When we look at this sculpture of St. Teresa in mystical ecstasy, we see in operation what the last slide suggested. The idea is that God is always already a moving presence within each of us. 
God is not and never has been other transcendent numinous. We do not cross a gap between his world and ours because already they are in our world, moving to express himself as the deepest part of our hearts. And now we come to Teilhard. And I need to have that standard look of Teilhard and his birth and death dates. And the reason Teilhard gets in trouble with the church is this is the spirit that moves Teilhard. His vision is that, they're all, is that there was always already a divine presence guiding, but also present in the evolutionary process. So it's not just an external guide, it's present inside. Here's a somewhat incomprehensible diagram of the noosphere, which will pass up. It's fun, but I can't use it right here. Um, to the next state, which is, um, Hang on, my avatar is misbehaving. Okay. The imminence on the noosphere. Wait now, what have I got here? I went too far. Let me go back. No? All right. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. They are believed that the divine lives in the very heart of the world. God is not somewhere else. Transcendence, the power of God, moves through creation. God becomes God through developing himself in this world and in the minds of his created people. And that's what the noosphere essentially is. God manifesting himself through the minds of people in this world. So the noosphere in classic Greek, nous is mind, thought, intelligence. Noosphere means an autonomous real thing composed of the complex web, web of thoughts generated by all minds. And that could include animal minds, I suspect. So that the, within, God is moving within us. And then we get to the next phase. The noah spirit supersedes the material level, cosmology, and the biological level, evolution, but takes these up into itself. And now I'm going to sound very Hegelian and includes them as its thoughts, which are also through us, God thinking himself or the divine thinking itself. And this takes us to point omega. When thought completes itself by thinking all of being as its own self, and that's really what we're talking about, and when every self individually thinks itself as one part of the whole, we achieve point omega or the omega point. I'm using the French iteration here. Uh, the moment when all of being thinks itself perfectly and God completes itself. So the idea here is that God is completing himself through evolution, through involvement in the world, and that if we look deep inside ourselves, we can find that divine presence. Now I want to connect Teilhard and Teresem a little bit. Both Teilhard and Teresem believe that we collectively create God. A difference is that Teilhard believes this is God creating himself, moving through us, while Teresem appears to believe, again appears, that God is a genuinely human creation made by humans. I'm not sure the difference is that great, but because both Teilhard and Teresem believe in the inevitability and the reality of the noosphere, of that complex of uh, thought. So that Teilhard and Teresem continued, a difference is that Teresem believes that nanotechnology will play a role in the creation of the noosphere, while Teilhard, writing in the 1930s, can't say anything about this because it wasn't around then. But both, and this is something that's very important, both Teilhard and Teresem believe in collective consciousness and that we will all someday be part of God. And then following from that, because both Teilhard and Teresem believe that all being is one, both believe in geoethics or our individual and collective responsibility to care for all beings, material, biological, and spiritual, as, interestingly, Pope Francis calls us on us to do in his recent climate change and cyclical Laudato Si. And here, not only the former Pope, but the present Pope rejoins Teilhard. 
and says in the encyclical, the ultimate destiny of the universe is in the fullness of God, which has already been attained by the risen Christ, the measure of the maturity of all things. This is the omega point. Here we can add yet another argument for rejecting every tyrannical and irresponsible domination of human beings over other creatures. The ultimate purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us and through us toward a common point of arrival, which is God, in that transcendent fullness where the risen Christ embraces and illumines all things. Human beings endowed with intelligence and love and joined by the fullness of Christ are called to lead all creatures back to their creator. That's the Pope. And now I have an, an Closing, um, shot of the Pope. Um, is this the transhumanist Pope? Will the future bring convergence among our spiritual visions? Only the future knows. And I end with that last slide. Only the future knows. Thank you. Kevin, if you haven't done so, please open up your chat box using the... I did. It's okay. open. But now I saw something from you, and now I don't have it. Where is it? I've got the, my chat box open. Do I have to go to you to get what you said? Okay, let's see. I'll try repressing it. Okay, redo it again. Oh, there it is. Okay. Lori asks... Um, Things on the nanoscale will it disappeared again. Why is that? I'll just I'll just say it. Things okay, on the nano, things on the nanoscale have always existed. It's our ability to see and work at this minute level that's pretty recent. Do you think this is a, a fresh way of looking at things Bayard, Bayard spoke of? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think he'd be very open to every um, new development. And I do think that the nano level is, is just fascinating. And I think he'd embrace that because he saw, as, as people have said before, uh, Teilhard is a very progressive thinker. And he sees divinity especially, and he sees the world saturated with divinity. That everything that happens, every new technology, every new invention, is some sort of a manifestation of a uh, plan working out. And I want to make one comment I didn't make during the talk. This is not intelligent design or creationism. Um, in that idea, which is very conservative, there's an external God who kind of fixes the game of evolution to work in a certain way. That's not Teilhard. He genuinely believes the divine is inside the creative process or the uh, evolutionary process with all its false starts and extinctions and genetic mutations that don't work, etc. All of that is part of the divine working out. So any technological development, those that work and those that don't work, is seen by Teilhard as part of the divine working itself out. Did you hear the question I just asked you, Kevin? No, I didn't hear a thing. <laughs> okay. Well, Denon asks, I like the idea of God, transcendent, and fully present universe. Can you comment more on your thoughts on this? Yes. Um, again, this is very much an old, old mystical Catholic tradition. And again, I want to reemphasize the complexity of any complex world religion. It has virtually everything that one can imagine in it. Uh, this idea, you find this certainly in Hegel, in Spinoza, in Jewish thought, in, in uh, Sufi mysticism, in Kabbalah, in, in uh, Buddhism, in Hinduism. The idea here is that the divine is imminent. 
it, he's deep inside, always already part of the way the universe works, and is working out its destiny and becoming itself only through the complexity of the incarnation in the world. The idea here is that there's no separation between divine power and transcendence and creativity and that which it makes. They're all one thing. And that God, in a sense, is never complete and doesn't really know, I hate to use a gender term, itself, herself, himself, until every human and every animal has thought every conceivable thought they're meant to think and has had every experience they're meant to have. So it's a sense of, com of a, a completion that's driving the system from inside. Would you please expand yes. on what first attracted you to Taird's writings at such an early stage, like right after they were published? Yes. Um, I think I was kind of a precocious kid. Um, I, I have to give credit to the Jesuits because having gone to both the Jesuit high school and a college, I found the Jesuits were always wildly open. Not wildly, but intelligently open to new ideas. And it never occurred to me that there should ever be a tension between um, religion and science. And I think when I read this, and this is all I, when I think back on it, I may be misremembering, I had no idea that they are this is any kind of trouble with the church. It probably would have made them a lot sexier, but I didn't know it. I just read this and I said, this makes a lot of sense, that um, there should be a consistency between evolution and the divine revelation. Uh, and I remember, just as, as an addendum to that, totally unrelated, uh, when I was in college taking a theology course from Louis Dupre, uh, who later went to the Yale Divinity School at Georgetown, um, when he described the, the book of Genesis and said there really wasn't a, a literal garden of the its first two people, I was just amazed, because I really, again, hadn't thought about that. So when I read Teilhard, it never occurred to me there'd be any tension between what he wrote and what the church said. And then I later found out, and uh, it's just baffling. Um, but it was just the, the power of the ideas. I mean, there are certain books you read, certain movies you see that literally change your life. And that was one of them. I've never really been the same since. And as I said in one iteration of the software, I didn't say, I'm probably a better Teardian than I am a Catholic. Do you have any words of advice to anyone who um, who's a lover of science and religion and would pick up a work like Teard's? Any any words of advice, having been an educator yourself? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I have a hunch about, Teilhard is a certain kind of writer and thinker, and I teach philosophy, and sometimes I teach in the same semester the work of Immanuel Kant and the work of Hegel. And when I try to teach students, is they, you need totally different reading strategies. Kant is architectonic, more what we would call scientific, building step by step. Hegel is like getting on a surfboard or playing uh, progressive jazz, you just got to go, you get on it and you move with it. You don't try to figure out what every word means. It's the totality. You let it ride, let it take you for the ride and see where it, it leads you. And that's Teilhard perfectly, I think, captured. You can't analyze them too deeply, but you have to, in a sense, give yourself over. I don't mean don't read the comments and the analytic stuff. That's equally important and be skeptical by Mike, like Michael Shermer. But sometimes you just got to let things ride and take you where they're going to take you. Are there any more questions for Kevin? Okay, Kevin, I don't see that there are any more questions at this time. Thank you so much. That was 
presentation that I gleefully listen to in practice and again in its delivery. Thank you. Now I gotta get my avatar back. Unfortunately, given that we're running a few minutes early, Dr. Rothfuss and Root with the uh, for-profit, she's not situated here at the nonprofit today. Uh, she did authorize me to run through her presentation slides, which are next. Um, uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to email them to me at Lori, L-O-R-I, at Harrison. Central.org, and I will briefly pose them to uh, Dr. Rothblatt for um, answers that I will probably deliver. So um, I am going to run through her slides, giving about a minute for each, and then I will um, open the floor for any discussions or questions about TerraSEM, its founders, its missions, its events. Uh, so I will take a few moments to scroll through this presentation. Kevin, if you would please disengage your speaker. Thank you. I'm just scrolling through the presentation, and when I'm when I end with these slides, then I'll open the floor for discussions. I'd like to add here, as we continue through Dr. Rothblatt's slide uh, presentation, which I'm not well versed enough to deliver, uh, 
But I do want to add that there are three different divisions to the terrorism organizations or terrorism family of organizations all with the same set, and, set of guiding principles called the Truths of Terrorism. There is the Terrorism Movement Incorporated, which is um, based in Florida. That is the uh, first and oldest, or say, parent of the sibling organizations. That is the organization I am with and, and who is putting forth this workshop today. And um, I have the uh, honor of being the longest serving terrorism employee. Um, then there is Terrorism Movement Foundation, which is based in, uh, let me see if I can catch up here, based in Bristol, Vermont. And the Terrorism Movement Foundation and the Terrorism Movement Incorporated have uh, some things in common, some projects, basically a mind filing project, utilizing different um, skill sets, different professionals to test the same hypotheses in regards to digitizing one's consciousness. And the third of the terrorism organizations, which has probably the most in common with Tayard's work, uh, in that um, much of, of what um, is in Tayard's writings or spouse within the truths of terrorism, that would be the religious aspect of terrorism called Terrorism Movement Trans Religion, and it's the youngest of the three organizations. Um, however, it's not new. Um, the Terrorism Movement Foundation was founded in 02, and I believe the Terrorism, um, Terrorism Movement Incorporated in 02, and I believe the Terrorism Movement Trans Religion in 04, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and I am working on something that will offer delineation of the three that will be posted on Wikipedia um, in the coming months. And that concludes Dr. Rothblatt's slide presentation, which I just added to. Uh, so I can now open the floor to um, any questions in the chat box um, in reference to Terrasem, uh, in reference to the founders, in reference to the events, projects, and journals that we have. Do, are there any questions? I do hear someone typing, so I am waiting for a question. Kevin asks, will this presentation appear online? If so, how can I find it? Um, Several things can happen. I will transcribe. I'm, I'm doing an audio recording as well as visual recording. The avatar on the front row, Eskatoon Magic, is assisting with that, very graciously so. Um, I will be doing a transcription, and all of the presentations from today will be considered for publishing in Terrorism's online journal called um, the Journal on Geoethical Nanotechnology. And I believe the slide in the that's up now has that link all the way to the front, uh, all the way to the right on the bottom. It's www.terrorismjournals.org. If, uh, of course, I would work with anyone whose presentation is being considered for publishing. Nothing is ever published without an author's explicit written permission and review. Um, also, I would like to, um, depending on the quality that we were able to capture with the uh, video, be able to publish that on YouTube. Anything that goes up, uh, will all, um, links will be provided to everyone who participated and anyone who asked so that they may easily and eagerly find um, the presentation. 
Uh, Michael Denon asks, what is the best way to follow up with future activities of TerraSent? Well, first and foremost, you may always email or call me. Um, I'm usually the one handling most of the public relations for the organization for Terrorism Movement Incorporated and quite often for Terrorism Movement Trans Religion. Um, if now through here you let me know that you are interested, if we have anything major coming up, then I can just drop you a line and let you know. Um, Terrorism also has a uh, website, www.terrorismcentral.org. Um, you may be able to keep up with uh, news and with what's going on with Terrasem just by visiting that site. I want to mention at this time that, oh, you're welcome, Michael, that um, in regards to testing the hypotheses on digitizing one's consciousness, the Terrasem Movement Incorporated, who I am with, has a project called CyberRev and that means Cybernetic Beingness Revival. It is located at S, uh, C, Y, B as in boy, E, R, E, V, Cy, B, Rev, dot org. And it is free to participate. However, you must request uh, to open an account before you open an account. And uh, that project works, uh, employs the... Um, the work of a sociologist by the name of Dr. Bill Bainbridge in regards to personality capture. And uh, we employ the Bainbridge modules, um, very graciously availed to us by Dr. Bainbridge, in um, capturing one's personality uh, toward testing that hypothesis of being able to digitize one's consciousness. The Terrorist Movement Foundation in Vermont has a similar um, project called LifeNaut, L-I-F-E-N-A-U-T. I believe it's LifeNaut.com. And, and they employ a different skill set and a different type of um, ability to record one's information. Uh, we also, um, at the Terrorism Movement Incorporated with our uh, CyberRev project, are able to space cast your mind files or your information into outer space for anyone who, when opening an account, an account clicks that box and allows us to do so. So um, the organizations are, are very, very interesting. And as I said, they all work from the same set of guiding principles known as the truths of TerraSAM. Kevin O'Neill asks, has this program been influenced by the work of Gennel and Bell at USC? Um, that is a question for Dr. Rothblatt. I can forward that to her. Um, that might have been something she could address. It's not something I can, as, as she conceived of and created and founded the terrorism organizations. Uh, I know the works of an author by the name of Octavia Butler were very influential. The works of um, Freeman Dyson, uh, Gerald K. O'Neill, Ray Kurzweil, um, uh, von Neumann, these were all uh, influential. They're all actually mentioned within uh, what Mortine had constructed called the Truths of Terrasem. Um, however, I, I do not know of the um, influences that you were asking. It doesn't mean they don't exist, but I will ask, ask Dr. Rothblatt and ask her to contact you with that answer or give me that answer and I will contact you with it. Even though I couldn't answer that question specifically, you are very welcome, and I will get you that answer as soon as possible. Are there any more questions? Well, I'd like, on behalf of Terrace Movement, Inc., its staff, Dr. Martine Rothblatt, Bina Aspen Rothblatt, I would like to thank everyone for coming and participating and attending the uh, Terrasum's 10th Annual Workshop on Geoethical Nanotechnology. I will be in touch with all who presented 
upon completing the transcript of your presentation that you uh, have every availability to edit, add, or delete. Um, and I will be available and in this venue until the last person leaves. So you're absolutely free to approach me and ask anything you wish. Now that the workshop has been um, adjourned, um, we're more free to uh, have our speakers on or turn our speakers on. Um, you can continue to speak in the chat box if you're more comfortable that way. Um, but it was an absolutely marvelous workshop, and I enjoyed every single presentation. And uh, I'm sure I'll have more questions as I go through the transcripts. But thank you again, everyone, for attending and participating.